It's time for Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network. Take the first 52 games of the season and throw them out the window. It all comes down to this. A do or die winner takes all game three of the Cape Cod League Championship Series between the Brewster Whitecaps and the Bourne Braves. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the game three, the final edition of the 2017 season for the Brewster Whitecaps here on the Brewster Whitecaps Radio Network. Aiden Doyle alongside Carter Wadeel. And Carter, after 52 games, we couldn't have asked for a better day here for game number three. It is. It's a gorgeous atmosphere. We got 3,000 people here for game one of this series, about the same at Bourne last night. And then it looks like we're going to have a terrific crowd here for this ball game today. Sunny skies had a bit of a misty or drizzly weather today, but that is history. And we're going to have some awesome for all the marbles baseball here today. Yeah, last night was a tough one for the Brewster Whitecaps. They had a chance to close it out at Doran Park in Bourne. They got out to an early lead, leading 7-3 to three going into the bottom of the fifth inning, but that's where it all came apart for Brewster. Yeah, that fifth inning took 34 minutes to complete. Eight runs coming in in that frame for the Whitecaps, and you could tell that it wasn't just tough uh, for the game as a whole because it only put Brewster down four runs, but the offense really lost its energy after that. No hits for the Whitecaps after that fifth inning for the rest of the ball game. Jamie Shevchik wanted wound up sending in some substitutes. So clearly that's the sort of game where you throw it out the window, you reset, you try to protect your home field in the next it, game. Protect your home field indeed. This is the first game three that the Whitecaps have played in these po or in these playoffs here at Stony Brook Field. The first one against the Whitey Red Sox and the second against the Orleans Firebirds were both on the road. So it's a familiar feeling for a game three for Brewster, completely foreign for the Braves. They swept both of their first uh, two series. But it's also unfamiliar because they've never played a game three here in Brewster. Yes, it's very interesting for the Whitecaps. The thing that they can draw on, of course, is that they've been able to protect their home field for this entire playoff series. Haven't lost a game at home. Now, granted, they've only played three games because they were the lower seed in the first couple of rounds. But that's still got to give their team some confidence. The fans have been rowdier than I think they've ever been here in Brewster for during this Cinderella playoff run. And they're certainly going to be out in full force for this ball game. Yeah, we've seen some drums here, people banging on some, you know, 10-gallon buckets. We've seen signs, fans all over the place. You said 3,004 fans for game one. I, I, I would bet that that record is broken today here for game three because this entire community here in Brewster has really gotten behind these Whitecaps. We've seen tweets, some posts, some, you know, just appreciation all over town from local businesses, fans all over the place people we've never seen this place here at Stony Brook Field this pack yeah it is and that's something that Jamie Shevchik is keenly aware of in the Whitecaps dugout when he talks about what the team is looking for what their motivation is to win ball games he talks about how it's more than just you know nine players on the field it's, it's something about the community and the fan base you know Brewster they did win a title back in 2000 they've never won a title when they've played here in Brewster at Stony Brook Field moved here in 2005 and that would mean a lot to this community to get a win in this town Yes, it would, as Coach Jamie Shevchik and Bourne Braves coach Harvey Shapiro are meeting with the umpires right now, going over the grounds rules. But we'll get you set on this Brewster lineup before the start of today's Game 3. And, well, for the final time this season, we'll let the Whitecaps introduce themselves. Nick Dunn, infield, University of Maryland. Mickey Gasper, catcher, Bryant University. Hey, I'm Marty Casas, outfielder, University of Maryland. Hunter Bishop, outfielder, Arizona State. Kyle Datris, infield, University of North Carolina. Chandler Taylor, University of Alabama, outfielder. Darius Hill, outfielder, West Virginia University. Julian Infante, infield, Vanderbilt. AJ Graffanino, shortstop for the University of Washington. Will Tribuker, left-handed pitcher, University of Michigan. And if you're a Whitecaps fan, you've got to feel pretty confident with that lineup going out onto the field for Brewster today. The only change, well, Darius Hill's a designated hitter introduced as an outfielder there but that's a lineup that we've seen a lot of success for with this Brewster Whitecaps team this postseason Carter. Yeah this Whitecaps this this lineup is the three for its last three in games they, they started the last two games of the Orleans series and then game one of this series three straight days Jamie Shevchik really likes the way that it's structured and the key thing about it is that Mickey Gasper who has been 
a real staple in the three hole for the Whitecaps for pretty much the whole season is bumped up to the two spot. That moves Costas to three, Bishop to four. It gets some more power bats at the front of the lineup, and that has really been a great decision, I think, from Jamie Shevchik on how the game has gone. And especially if this game turns into a nail biter, which it very well could, you want an extra at bat or two for those guys, and that's the way this lineup is structured. Yeah, the, this lineup has been extremely productive for this Whitecaps team, and they're going up against a familiar face in the born starter. It's Daniel B. is the right-hander out of Gonzaga University in Washington. They've seen him here at Stony Brook Field before. That in game one of the doubleheader between the Braves and the Whitecaps way back in June. And they had some success against them. They did. They tagged him for four runs in five innings pitched. And keeping in mind that that's a bigger uh, point of portion of the game, given the fact that it was a, a twin bill that day. And he's got a reputation as a strike thrower, does Daniel Bees. And for Brewster, it's just going to be about getting hard contact, maybe being a little bit more aggressive than these Whitecaps are used to. They've gone through a lot of long at-bats. We saw a little bit of it last night and in game one of this series as well. But the other thing to keep in mind here is that Bees is going to be on a short leash. I mean, this is a must-win game. Bourne has pretty much their entire bullpen at their disposal and Harvey Shapiro is not going to be afraid to bring out the hook if he feels that Bees doesn't have it. Yes, he, he's made that clear in that he, it's all hands on deck for both teams today because, frankly, well, it's the last game of the season. You have to be. You're going for a championship. Nothing left off the field. Everything. Put everything you have into this game. That's the message from Coach Jamie Shevchuk and from Coach Harvey Shapiro to their teams as Coach Jamie Shevchuk is meeting with his team right now just to the left of third base, going over a little pregame chat. And we'll get you set on the Bourne Braves lineup real quick before the start of this game. Leading off and playing second base is Grant Williams, batting second and getting the start at first base is Lyle Lynn, the Arizona State Stun Devil. Jared Triolo batting third and playing third. Jamison Hanna, center fielder out of Dallas Baptist, bats fourth. Kevin Radzowicz, the designated hitter, bats fifth. And Zach Susie bats six, gets the start behind the plate. Tyler Fitzgerald is starting shortstop. He bats seventh. Grant Witherspoon gets a start in right field. He bats eighth. And Andy Atwood rounding out that Braves lineup in left field. And we'll take a short break for the National Anthem. When you come back, it's game three. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Whedeal and Aiden Doyle. Back here in Brewster where Will Tribuker has taken the mound, throwing his warm-up pitches to Mickey Gasper. And like we talked about before the break, Carter, this is a situation that the Whitecaps are familiar with, Game 3, but they've never faced one like this in the League Championship Series with the title on the line. And for more on how the team's feeling, we go to more Sheridan. 
Thanks, guys. Well, I talked to Jamie Shevchik before the game for the last time this season, and he was so loose. We were talking, and he just was joking around, and he told me that he's feeling great. He says the team is feeling great. They know they deserve to be here, as Nick Dunn said last night, and so they're not worried at all. What's meant to be is meant to be a little bit of philosophy there from Coach Shevchik, but he, he's feeling good, and he did say the one thing is that everybody knows not to talk to Will Tribuker before a game. He's locked in. He'll sit there, gets in the zone, and everybody knows to just stay away, keep their distance. Tribuker just has his own rhythm that he likes to do before games, and he did it today, and he said Tribuker is as locked in as ev ever. So some good vibes in the dugout for the Whitecaps. Back to you guys. Thanks, Maura. And we've seen Will Tribuker in a do-or-die game here at Stony Brook Field, and we've also seen him come in in a big spot in the Orleans series, Carter, and he's pitched admirably in both of them. Yeah, one of the more unlikely heroes on this entire Whitecaps team when you talk about the Cinderella playoff run that they have had. I don't think we've seen a more impressive performance in these playoffs for the Whitecaps than when Tribuker came in and slammed the door on the Orleans Firebirds, struck out the two, three, and four hitters on the team with the most wins in the league to win that must-win game three at Eldridge Park. This is his first appearance since then. Lefty out of the University of Michigan was actually named the Cape League Pitcher of the Week for the first couple of rounds of the playoffs. And actually, Whitecaps left fielder Marty Costas was the Player of the Week, so another Whitecaps duo. That's the second time this year that that's happened. As Grant Williams digs in, looks at a first pitch fastball over the inner half for strike one, and game three is underway. Williams, the second baseman and leadoff hitter for Bourne out of Kennesaw State, lifts this one in the air over the third base dugout out of play, and the count now 0 and 2. Get you set on that Whitecaps defense real quick in the outfield, moving from left to right. Costas, Bishop, and Taylor in the infield from third to first. It's Datris, Graffinino, Dunn, and Infante, and Mickey Gasper doing the catching behind the plate. 0 2 from Tribuker on its way. This one misses below the knees downstairs. Count out one and two on Williams. Williams, left-handed hitter against left-handed throwing Tribuker. Works through the windup and the one-two pitch. Waved that and missed in the dirt. Picked up by Gasper, a throw on the first. And they get him a little bit of a wild throw there, but Julian Infante able to keep his toe on the bag. So we'll one batter into this game, Will Tribuker already has a strikeout. And, well, and Julian Infante already has a little play that doesn't go in the box score at first base. I mean, that would have been an inauspicious start with a drop third strike, but able to uh, get the, as you said, Aiden, just keep that foot anchored. Well done from the Vanderbilt Commodore. And now digs in Lyle Lynn, the first baseman out of Arizona State. Right-handed hitting number two hitter for Bourne. And the first pitch from Tribuker on its way. Fastball right down Main Street for strike one. Lynn got off to a bit of a rough start in these Cape League playoffs, but has played well here in this series against Brewster as Tribuker paints the outside corner with another fastball, and Lynn's quickly behind 0-2. Tribuker looking into Gasper, through the windup and the 0-2 pitch. Fastball just hit on the ground softly towards first, but this one will slice foul, and Lynn will retreat back to the right-handed batter's box, and we'll do it again. Fastball from Tribuker on the outside part of the plate. Lynn just tried to get a piece of it and nubbed it foul down the first baseline. 0-1 to the count, one out, and the pitch from Tribuker. Fastball just misses below the knees, says home plate umpire Mickey Garcia, and the count now one and two. Tribuker ready, and the one-two pitch. Caught on and missed. Lynn chased one down and in, and that's back-to-back -back strikeouts to start off this game for Will Tribuker. So far, it looks like Tribuker's breaking stuff is working pretty darn well early on. That's one thing to kind of look for to see if he's locked in on the mound. So far, so good. And now it'll be Jared Triolo, the born third baseman, hailing from the University of Houston. He's off to a great start. Well, he's having a great playoffs, batting 385 in six games for Bourne. Right-handed hitting number three hitter, and the first pitch from Tribuker shows bunt, but takes it back as the southpaw misses below the knees for ball one. Two outs in the top of the first inning. Here in game number three of this league championship series, as Will Tribuker deals. This fastball paints the outside corner as Triolo showed bunt again, but took it back. Count levels now at one and one. Just a beautiful day here in Brewster, no clouds. 
Not a whole lot of action on the flagpole out in right center. As a changeup from Tribuker misses outside now to Triolo. Just ahead in the count, two balls and one strike. Tribuker looking into Gasper. Through the windup and the 2 1 pitch. This fastball misses down and in. Now 3 and 1 on Triolo. Jamison Hanna waits on deck for the Braves. He homered in last night's ball game at Doran Park, straight away center field. As a 3-1 pitch from Tribuker. This is down and away, appeal down to the first base umpire. Nick DeMarkey says Triolo went around, so it would have been ball four, but Jared Triolo unable to check his swing, and now it's a full count on the Bourne third baseman. Three and two the count, two outs, top of the first inning. Triolo digs back in from the right side. Drive Buker through the windup and the payoff pitch. Fastball misses downstairs, and Triolo works a two-out walk. Great at bat there from Triolo. Took a couple of tough pitches below the knees, the sort of stuff that Tri Buker likes to get guys to swing over or, or hit a little nubber on the ground. Did a good job laying him off. Warren's going to have to keep that up if they want to get base runners on against this guy. Now it's Jamison Hanna, the center fielder out of Dallas Baptist, digging in. It's a lefty-lefty matchup as Triolo takes a short lead off of first. Drive Buker comes set, and the first pitch. Fastball in the dirt, and it gets by Gasper. Moving to second is Triolo. And so now the Braves have a runner in scoring position with two outs. Let's see how that one scored. But either way, it's a 1-0 and count on Jamison Hanna. Triolo off second base. Two outs here in the top of the first. And that is scored a pass ball on Mickey Gasper. Dry Buker ready, and the 1-0 pitch. Goes to the breaking ball there and finds a zone to even the count at one and one. Hannah's probably having the best postseason out of any born Braves hitter. Batting 423 as a home run, six RBI. Although he lines this one foul towards what would be the Whitecaps on deck circle, just misses hitting a photographer. And a one and two count now on Hannah. One ball, two strikes, two outs, top of the first inning. Jared Triolo leading off second base for the Braves. Dry Buker looking into Gasper, comes set. And the one-two pitch. Fastball skips home, good block there by Mickey Gasper to keep it in front of him. Count now two and two on the Bourne center fielder. No score here in Brewster in the top of the first inning. Although a chance for the Braves here with two outs. Triolo worked a walk and then advanced to second on the passed ball. And now it's a 2-2 count on Jamison Hanna. Dry Buker ready and the 2-2 pitch. This one lifted in the air. Stay in the infield moving towards the dugout is Kyle Datris. And he makes the play just in front of the Brewster Whitecaps dugout for out number three. So the Braves move a runner to scoring position but can't do anything after that. It's no runs on no hits, no errors. One left on base for the Whitecaps in the top of the first inning, and we head to the bottom of the first here in game number three, and the Brewster Whitecaps are coming to bat here on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle. Bottom of the first inning coming up. No score here in Brewster. And Nick Dunn leading things off for the Whitecaps. And the first pitch from Daniel Bees. A fastball in the outside corner for a strike one. Dunn had a great day yesterday in game number two. Went three for three with three runs batted in. And the 0-1 pitch on its way. This fastball paints the inside corner as Nick Dunn looks back at home plate umpire Mickey Garcia, who gives an, aff an affirmative nod. 0-2 now the count on the Maryland Terrapin. At the 0-2 pitch on its way, this fastball misses off the plate outside and count now 1-2. and two. Bees looking into his catcher, Zach Susi. Comes set. And a 1-2 breaking ball misses high and outside and count levels two balls and two strikes. Mickey Gasper waiting on deck for Brewster. As Dunn ready to lead things off here in the bottom of the first. 2-2 two -two fastball misses high and inside and Dunn after falling behind 0-2 battles back to a full count. Bees comes set. And the payoff pitch. Fastball fouled off down the third base line right over the Whitecaps dugout and into a group of fans who have situated themselves on top of a little berm there down the third base line. But Dunn able to stay alive and the count stays full. Bees ready and the payoff pitch. Fastball misses high and Nick Dunn after falling behind 0-2 works a leadoff walk and that seems to be how these Whitecaps get innings started when they're having success, Carter. It sure is. They walk a lot, and especially against a guy like Bees, who has a reputation for throwing strikes, that's impressive from Nick Dunn that he's able to lay off those pitches. And now Mickey Gasper digging in from the left side. Switch hitter batting left against the right-handed throwing Bees, who you mentioned, Carter. Throws a lot of strikes. Made one appearance in this postseason. It was a start, went four and two-thirds. As the fastball misses off the plate to Gasper, 1-0 now the count. Allowed just one earned run in that appearance. That was game one of the Western Division Championship Series against the Wareham Gateman. One ball, no strikes, and the pitch to Gasper. Fastball cut on and missed up in the zone to even the count at one and one. No outs here in the bottom of the first inning. One and one the count on Mickey Gasper as Nick Dunn leads off of first base. Daniel Bees looking into Susie. Comes set. And the 1-1 pitch. Breaking ball misses high above the letters, and Gasper's ahead in the count, two balls and one strike. Still no action on the flagpole out in right center, which is a rare scene here at Stony Brook Field from this season. Typically, the wind blows out towards left center field. As a 2-1 pitch on its way, this fastball lifted high in the air in the infield, moving in as the first baseman, Lynn, calling for it, and he puts it away just in front of and to the right of the pitcher's mound for out number one. Nice job directing traffic by Lynn. The whole infield kind of converged over there, but Lynn was calling for it from the beginning. And now it's Marty Costas, the left fielder out of Maryland, digging in for the Whitecaps. Righty righty matchup here between Bees and Costas, who's really found his place in the either the three or the four spot with but with this new look lineup from the playoffs for Brewster, really solidified that number three spot for. Whitecaps as he looks at a first pitch breaking ball in for strike one. When Gasper was hitting third, it was primarily Costas behind him, but once Gasper moved up to the two spot, so didn't Costas. And now it's a fastball from Bees on the outside corner, and Costas quickly finds himself in an 0-2 hole. Marty batting 290 in these playoffs. Had a big home run in game number three of the Eastern Division Championship Series. As a breaking ball in there, strike three on the upper part of the zone. Costas down looking for out number two. Well, that was right on the outer edge there. Mickey Garcia, the home plate ump, is very well respected. One of the uh, Curl de Clement Award winners won it last season. So if uh, Marty Costas sees that, I'm sure the next time he comes up, he'll be thinking about how that outside corner is being called. Always important to adjust to the ump, something that Hunter Bishop has a lot of experience with. And speaking of Hunter Bishop now, he digs in from the left side for Brewster. Bees from the stretch, first pitch a breaking ball. This one finds his own for strike one. The big looping breaking ball from Bees throws it for strikes. 
able to command his pitches well. 0-1 the count, two outs, bottom of the first inning, as the fastball from the right-hander out of Gonzaga misses off the play to even the count at 1-1. One one. He's a rather imposing figure on the mound, six foot eight, 255 pounds, that's what he's listed at. And he deals a 1-1 one one pitch. Another breaking ball that finds the outside part of the zone to move the count to one and two on Bishop. That was more of a slurvy sort of pitch. Well done with those two breaking balls. And now Bishop is probably wondering, am I going to see a fastball here? One ball, two strikes, two outs. Nick Dunn leading off first. As Bees misses high and outside, count levels two balls and two strikes. Bishop. Power hitting center fielder out of Arizona State. Awaits the 2-2. Here it comes. Fastball inside corner. Bishop down looking. So the Whitecaps get a leadoff walk, but are set down in order after that. No runs on no hits, no errors. One left on base in the bottom of the first inning. We've played an inning here at Stony Brook Field in game number three of the Cape League Championship Series. No score between the Whitecaps and Braves. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network. It'll be five, six, and seven in the Braves' order due up here in the top of the second inning. No score between the Whitecaps and the Braves. Aiden Doyle alongside Carter Woodiel here on the Whitecaps radio network. It'll be Kevin Radswich, Zach Suzy, and Tyler Fitzgerald due up for Bourne against Will Tribuker, who got the start here in a winner-take-all game three for the Brewster Whitecaps. And the first pitch from Tribuker to Radswich. Fastball on the outside corner for strike one. And that outer corner to righties and inside corner to lefties is the one that Mickey Garcia rung both hitters up, Costas and Bishop, to end that first inning. Tribuca got a call there as well to start this at bat off. A one pitch on its way. Goes to the breaking ball there and a nice one as it finds the inside part of the plate for strike number two. Tribuca doing a good job changing speeds, changing eye levels early on in this ball game. He's heading, ahead in the count 0-2 to Radzwich. And here it comes. Tries to go to the two-seam fastball there, but misses off the plate. Count out one and two. Radzowicz, the born designated hitter out of Fairfield University. Batting 273 in these playoffs. And awaits the one-two pitch. Here it comes. Chopped right back up the middle, ranging to his right as Nick Dunn backhands it, plants it, and throws to first. In time, a heck of a play from Nick Dunn. That one looked like it had a date with center field as a leadoff single, but Nick Dunn takes it away, and the first out of the inning goes as a 4-3. That sure did look like it was headed for center. A little 11 hopper, and a great job by Nick Dunn to not give up on the play, hustle over and backhand, and a good stretch by the first baseman and Fonte as well. So far, the defense has been sharp for Brewster. And now Zach Susie, the catcher for the Braves, digs in from the left side. Out of the University of Connecticut, so a lefty-lefty matchup on the first pitch from Tribuker skips home for ball one. That one got past Casper and is retrieved by Brewster bat boy Asher Woods. Tribuker through the windup and the 1-0 pitch. This one hit on the ground foul towards first. Right past a photographer. And one of the things I've noticed, Carter, as the count now one and one, is that here in the playoffs with the increase in the number of photographers, we've seen a lot more of them be not exactly behind protective screens. We'll put it that way. 
as a 1-1 pitch on its way. This one driven out towards left field, towards the line and the corner, slicing just foul. That one, if it stayed fair, would have been extra bases for Susie, but now the count one and two. Here at Stony Brook Field, we have one photographer right where the Brewster on deck circle typically is. We have another in play down the first base line, but not in fair territory, but about halfway between the Braves dugout and first base. One ball, two strikes on the left-handed hitting Susie. One out here in the top of the second inning. No score between the Braves and Whitecaps. And the 1-2 pitch. Breaking ball misses down and away. Tried to get Susie to chase there, but the count evens at two balls and two strikes. Susie batting just 0-95 in these playoffs so far. 2-4-21 in five games. And the 2-2 pitch looped out into towards shortstop. Underneath it is A.J. Graffinino, and he puts it away for out number two. A lot of soft contact right now against Will Tribuker Buker here. Probably the hardest ball we've seen hit was the liner that landed foul in the, earlier in that at-bat. He's doing a great job, and part of that is getting ahead in the count early, throwing strike one. He's doing a terrific job painting the corners early in at-bat. That's really his bread and butter on the mound. Getting ahead early and generating soft contact. He's not, unless you're Steven Scott of the Orleans Firebirds, he's not really a guy who's going <laughs> to blow you away but he does a great job generating soft contact as his first pitch now to Tyler Fitzgerald. Way out in front of that one was the foreign shortstop as he swings through an off-speed pitch for strike number one. Tribuker had him fooled there. Looked like a changeup from the lefty. Now he works through the windup and the 0-1 pitch. Fastball cut on and missed up in the zone. And we talked about getting strike one, but how about an 0-2 count on Fitzgerald here with two outs in the top of the second? Drybeaker doing an excellent job getting ahead of hitters. Looking into Gasper, now through the windup and the 0-2 pitch. Fastball just misses down and away. Fitzgerald able to hold up, and the count now 1-2. And two. And that hit the target from Drybeaker. A terrific take there from Fitzgerald. Drybeaker working quickly, 1-2 pitch. Breaking ball hit on the ground, just foul to the left of third base. Says Rick Del Vecchio, who's the third base umpire today here at Stony Brook Field. Get you set on those umpires. Mickey Gasper, or <laughs> Mickey Gasper is behind the plate, but it's Mickey Garcia, the umpire, doing balls and strikes. Nick DeMarkey at first. That's one two pitch. This one nubbed foul down the first base line. Fitzgerald doing a good job battling here against Tribeaker. Rick Cacciatore is the second base umpire. And like I mentioned, Rick Del Vecchio at third. One ball, two strikes, two outs, top of the second inning. No score here at Brewster. As Drybeaker through the windup and the pitch. Another one fouled off by Fitzgerald. This one straight back into the netting behind home plate. And the count remains one and two. Fitzgerald, who had a bit of a rough season offensively for the Braves, having a great postseason, batting 506 games, nine for 18. As he awaits the one-two pitch from Drybeaker, here it comes. Chases it downstairs, blocked by Gasper. Throw on the first in time, and Will Drybeaker picks up his Third strikeout of the outing. It's a 1-2-3 inning for the Michigan Wolverine. And after one and a half here in Brewster, still no score between the Braves and the Whitecaps. Do you know what that sound is? That's your new digital marketing department. And that'll be your new web designer. And that, that's Haibu where these experts are joined by many more, from web designers to search marketing specialists who work hard to get your business noticed online and on mobile. Best of all, Haibu can do it all for you or give you the tools to do it yourself. To find out more, go to Haibu.com. That's H-I-B-U.com. Or call 855-464-HAIBU. Oh, that'll be your next new customer. Haibu, made for business. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wedeal and Aiden Doyle. 
whole lot of zeros up on the scoreboard here at Stony Brook Field as we move to the bottom of the second inning. No te or neither team has a run, neither team has a hit, neither team has an error. And Kyle Datris digging in from the right side to start off this bottom of the second inning here at Stony Brook Field against Daniel Bees. Aiden Doyle alongside Carter Wadiel on the Whitecaps radio network. First pitch to Datris, a breaking ball in for strike one in the upper part of the zone. Wonder how many breaking ball strikes we're going to see in this game. Bees and Tribuker both like to throw it. Datris, right-handed hitting third baseman out of North Carolina. Looks at a 1-2 fat or an 0-1 fastball. That one paints the outside corner. Count now 0-2. Righty righty matchup between Bees and Datris as Chandler Taylor waits on deck and the 0-2 pitch on its way. Breaking ball. This one misses down and in, says Mickey Garcia. And now it's a one and two count on Datris. If you're looking for splits, Bees has a lot more success against right-handed hitters than lefties. As fastball on the outside part of the plate, Datris tries to hold up, and he does, says Nick DeMarkey, the first base umpire. That one missed down away in the dirt, and Datris was able to check his swing, so the count now two and two. Two balls, two strikes, no outs. Daniel B has come set. And the pitch. Fastball fouled off by Datris. That one went right off the mask of Zach Susie. Count stays two and two as Mickey Garcia taps him on the back. Just confirming that the born catcher is all right. If he wasn't awake before that, he certainly is now. As the 2-2 pitch on its way. That one breaking ball with zero bite at all. That one missed up above the head of Kyle Datris and the count now full on the Brewster third baseman. Yeah, a little William Tell action there with the ball right above his head. Datris looking to get things started here in the bottom of the second inning for the Whitecaps. Full count and the payoff pitch. Fastball fouled off by Datris back into the netting behind home plate, so we'll do it again in Brewster. I'll make a prediction here, Carter. This has got to be the biggest crowd we've seen at Stony Brook Field, even more so than mm -hmm. game number one. Center field, the berm out behind the center field fence is packed. Both lines, right and left, are packed. It's a payoff pitch by Datris. Ground ball towards second, fielded by Grant Williams. Easy throw on the first base for out number one. Yeah, it's terrific to see all the fans turn out. It's kind of funny. You, you always wonder how many people can this place really hold, and we're finding an answer today. And now Chandler Taylor stepping in for the Brewster Whitecaps. Right fielder and number six hitter out of Alabama. Tied for the Cape Cod League lead in home runs in the regular season with nine. Has one in this postseason that came right here at Stony Brook Field. In game number two against the Orleans Firebirds. As the first pitch to Taylor, breaking ball that misses high and outside for ball one. He's working quickly, comes set. And the 1-0 pitch. Fastball fouled off by Taylor into the netting back into the left of home plate. Count now 1-1. One and one. Taylor reaches down into the batter's box, grabs some dirt, rubs it between his hands. Now gets set as he steps back into the box. He's ready. And the 1-1 pitch. Fastball misses high and outside. Taylor ahead in the count, two balls and one strike. Taylor not even stepping out of the box here. Waits the 2-1 pitch. Here it comes. Another fastball that misses high and outside. 3-1 the count on Taylor. Good job here by Chandler. Laying off some pitches and getting ahead in the count, three balls and one strike as Darius Hill waits on deck for the Whitecaps. Taylor started off this season as a temporary player for the Whitecaps. Earned his way a spot on the roster as he fouls off an outside fastball there back into the backstop behind home plate and the count runs full. A guy, Carter, who as this season progressed, more permanent players started to arrive. Coach Shevchik, you know, said we got to try and find spots for all these guys. Was able to hang on to Taylor and I'm sure he's thankful he did as he fouls off the payoff pitch down the left field line. This one drops beyond the Whitecaps dugout, and the count stays full. 
It's good to see Chandler Taylor battling here, working along at bat. We've seen a lot of uh, three true outcomes for him, a lot of strikeouts, a lot of walks in this postseason. Trying to wait for a pitch he can get a hold of. Be set, and the payoff pitch. Fastball cut on and missed. Taylor swung at that one up in the zone. He goes down swinging. It's the third strikeout for Bees, the first one swinging, though. And Darius Hill now steps in for Brewster with two outs. And I tell you what, that pitch looked enticing from here. We're sitting directly behind home plate, and there's not a lot of room between us and the home plate because there's not a lot of field of play behind the plate here at Stony Brook Field. And that was an enticing pitch for Chandler Taylor, but it was, as you said, just up above the zone. He fooled him with a high fastball. So far, Bees is looking good. We could have a pitcher's duel on our hands. And Bees the first pitch to Darius Hill, a fastball that misses high above the letters for ball one. No score here in Brewster with two outs in the bottom of the second inning. Still no hits for either side. It's a 1-0 count on Darius Hill. And the pitch. Fastball lifted in the air down the left field line. Slicing foul. Giving chase is the third baseman Triolo. But this one will drop out of play. So the count evens at 1-1. One and one. Here at Stony Brook Field, the position players really have to be aware of where that out of play line is. Sometimes we see it with a couple of feet of buffer room between the line and the front or the beginning of the bleachers down the left field and right field lines. Sometimes it's right on top of them. 1-1 one, one pitch on its way. Breaking ball lined over the head of the shortstop. Fitzgerald and into left field. Darius Hill with a two-out single. And yesterday, Coach Jamie Shevchik referred to Darius Hill as a spark plug. And I think we've seen that in these playoffs. You're right, Aiden. Uh, you know, the designated hitter role for the Whitecaps after Michael Curry left the team is, you know, was a big question mark going into the postseason. Who's going to be the guy to fill that role? And along with moving Gasper to the two-hole, one of the key characteristics of this lineup that Coach Shevchik keeps coming back to is having Darius Hill in at the DH because he can do the little things well. Love's going the opposite way, primarily, primarily a line drive hitter. Although Julian Infante digs in now. First pitch swinging at an off-speed pitch from Bees. Gets nothing. Count now 0-1. Infante, first baseman out of Vanderbilt University. Does have a home run in these playoffs. That coming here at Stony Brook Field. 0-1 the count. And the pitch from Bees. Fastball down in the dirt, swung it and missed. Runner going for second as it got away from Susie. And in there safely is Darius Hill. A great read by Darius Hill. And now you have a runner in scoring position with two outs. And I tell you what, Darius Hill got caught flat-footed last time he had a situation like that. What was it, two days ago? And it was hampered over at first base. That time he was able, like you said, Aiden, to have a great heads-up play and advance. We'll see how they score it, but either way, it's a runner in scoring position. It will go as a wild pitch off Bees. But that one didn't get too far away from Susie. Just it remained in the home plate circle just to his right a bit. And Hill, who has good speed, just with a great read off of it and was able to get into second safely. And so now, Infante, who is you know, a power bat, so certainly capable of putting it over the fence. But if he gets you know, a single here, you potentially have a run scoring RBI single. With that runner in scoring position now with two outs. So a bit of a different situation here in the bottom of the second inning. 0-1-2 the count on Infante, two outs. Swung on and missed, chased a breaking ball downstairs. Infante swings through three straight pitches from Bees for out number three. So the Whitecaps pick up a two-out single and advance to second, does Darius Hill on a wild pitch, but he stays there. No runs on one hit, no errors. One left on base for the Whitecaps in the bottom of the second. We've played two in game number three of this Cape League Championship Series. No score between the Whitecaps and Braves on the Whitecaps radio network.
Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle. After two innings, we're still scoreless here in Brewster as the number eight hitter Grant Witherspoon digs in from the left side for the Braves. He'll face Will Tribuker, who's worked two scoreless frames to start this game off. And the first pitch misses down and in in the dirt for ball one to Witherspoon. Whitecaps did pick up their first hit in the bottom of the second. Darius Hill lined a single to left field. That's a 1-0 pitch from Tribeaker. Showed bunt did Witherspoon, but took it back as the southpaw missed below the knees for ball two. Now 2-0 two on the born right fielder. Tribeaker threw the windup and the 2-0 pitch. This one chopped foul down the first base line out of play. Two balls, one strike. Nobody out as Witherspoon leads off this top of the third. Tribeaker ready and the 2-1 pitch. Fastball misses down and away. Now 3-1 and one on Witherspoon. Lefty-lefty matchup here between Tribuker and Witherspoon. We've gotten the start in right field today for the Braves. That's where we've seen him all season. He drives this one out towards left field. Moving towards left center is Marty Costas. Has a beat on it and puts it away for out number one. Perhaps not the most direct route there from Marty Costas, but a good job tracking that baseball down in the sun. Fortunately, this is a, a much better day, fortunately, for the outfielders in terms of fielding than we had yesterday. I mean, yesterday was gloomy, foggy, gray, and today we got a nice blue sky and sunshine. But especially for the right fielders, Taylor and Witherspoon, things could get dicey as the game goes along with that sun. Andy Atwood digs in now. First pitch from Tribuker. Misses high and inside as Atwood showed bunt but took it back. After ball one. Right-handed hitting left fielder for Bourne. As Tribuker pours in a fastball in the lower part of the zone to even the count at one ball and one strike. Atwood out of Oregon State. Awaits the 1-1 pitch. Here it comes. Swing and a miss as he chased that one downstairs. Now one and two on the number nine hitter. Tribuker looking into Gasper. Takes a deep breath, and the 1-2 pitch. Goes to the breaking ball, just misses off the outside edge, says Mickey Garcia, and the count levels two balls and two strikes. Tribeaker towing the rubber, rubber quickly. Ready, and the 2-2 pitch. This one looped out into right field, giving chase is Chandler Taylor. He's on the run, and he makes the catch, running towards the line. A uh, heck of a play, a nice play by Chandler Taylor for the second out of the inning. And he had to get a great beat on that baseball to get it. That was tailing toward the line, and he did a terrific job knowing where that baseball was headed. Wound up all the way in the Braves' bullpen by the time he kind of slowed down his run over to it. And now it's back to the top of the order for the Braves and Grant Williams. Struck out swinging in his first at-bat. Lead-off hitter and the second baseman for Bourne. He shows bunt here as Tribuker pours in a first-pitch fastball on the outer edge. Williams, second baseman out of Kennesaw State, where he's going into his senior year. 0-1 breaking ball from Tribeaker, just misses off the outer edge to even the count at 1-1. One and one. Williams, a left-handed hitter against a left-handed throwing Tribeaker, who goes back to the breaking ball. This one finds a zone, and it's a 1-2 and two count now on Williams. Whitecaps defense playing him straight away as the one-two pitch on its way. Breaking ball hit on the ground towards first. Fielded cleanly by Infante, and he'll take it himself to the bag. Another one-two-three inning for Will Tribuker. He's set down seven in a row, and we head to the bottom of the third. Still scoreless here in Brewster. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Whedeal and Aiden Doyle. It'll be 9-1-2 and two in the Brewster order, due up at the bottom of the third inning against Daniel Bees. We're still scoreless here in Brewster. Graffinino, A.J. Graffinino, that is, leading things off for Brewster. Number nine hitter and the shortstop for the Whitecaps. First pitch from Bees. Fastball in the outside corner for strike one. A.J. digging in from the left side against the right-handed throwing Bees. Battle of Washington schools here. Breaking ball here from B is lifted in the air down the left field line, but out of play. Count now 0-2 on Graffinino. B is working out of the stretch. Come set and the 0-2 pitch. Fastball hit on the ground between short and third. Ranging into the hole is the shortstop Fitzgerald. Long throw on a first, not in time to get the speedy Graffinino. And the Whitecaps pick up an infield single to start things off in the bottom of the third. Yesterday, Carter, the Braves had a lot of infield singles in that big eight-run fifth inning. And that's how the Whitecaps get it started here in the bottom of the third. Yeah, it's true. They had three of them. I'm not sure that there was anything Fitzgerald could have done to prevent that. Made a great route to the ball and had a pretty, dirt, pretty darn good throw on it over to first. But A.J. Graffinino throughout this postseason has done a great job igniting rallies out of a nine spot for the Whitecaps. And... It could be the start of something here in this frame. And now at the top of the order, like you mentioned, Carter, it's guys that Coach Jamie Shevchik wants up in this situation. Nick Dunn digging in from the left side, and first pitch from Bees lifted in the air towards left field, giving chase to Andy Atwood toward the line, and he makes the catch straddling that left field line as Graffinino retreats back to the bag for as there's one away now in the bottom of the third. That's well, kind of unusual to see Nick Dunn make a first pitch out. I don't know how many times we've seen that this year. Typically a guy who sees a lot of pitches in his at-bats. And now here comes another guy who sees a lot of pitches in his at-bats, Mickey Gasper, switch hitting catcher for the Whitecaps. As the Mickey Gasper chance rain down from the third base side here at Stony Brook Field. He's got his own song going. <laughs> not sure if it's just his. <laughs> it's not, but it's a variation made for him. As the first pitch from B, his fastball in the outside corner. Gasper didn't like it. That one catches the outer edge, says Mickey Garcia. So an 0-1 count on Gasper. Graffinino leading off of first. He's set, and the 0-1 pitch. This one driven out towards right center field. On the run is Jamison Hanna, and that will fall in. Rounding second is Graffinino. He's moving to third. Gasper with a big turnaround first, but he'll retreat back to the bag as the throw comes into second, and now it's runners at the corners for Marty Costas. I know we've seen a lot of interesting defensive positioning for the teams Brewster has played and the Whitecaps themselves this postseason, but that time Hanna wasn't where he needed to be, outshading toward left field and center field. That one dropped maybe only three or four steps to toward the right side of straightaway center, but since Hanna was playing on Gasper, Gasper to go the other way, had to run all the way over, had to play it on a hop. And Hanna's a speedy guy to mm -hmm. on center field, so you know if he can't run it down, he can't get to it that it was pretty darn far away from where he was positioned. Well, Marty Costa is digging in now from the right side. Struck out looking in his first at bat, but a chance here to do some damage for the Whitecaps. Runners at first and third. Graffinino off third, Gasper off first. And the first pitch from B is a fastball that misses high for ball one. Costa, left fielder out of the University of Maryland, was named the player of the week in the playoffs for the Cape Cod League for the first two rounds. And he awaits the 1-0 pitch from Bees. It's a breaking ball in for a strike to even the count at 1-1. One one. One's across the board. One ball, one strike, one out. Bottom of the third inning. No score here in Brewster between the Whitecaps and the Braves. Runners at the corners, though, for the Whitecaps. 1-1 one, one pitch. Breaking ball just misses down and away. And Costas now ahead in the count. Two balls and one strike. Righty-righty matchup between Bees and Costas. And the 2-1 pitch on its way. Fastball on the outside corner that Costas fouls back into the netting, and now it's a 2-2 count. Graffinino off third. Gasper with a short lead off first. Bees set. 2-2 pitch. This one chopped foul on the first baseline. Costas stays alive, and the count stays 2-2. Two and two. It's a good job by spoiling that 
from Marty. He looked like he was a little bit out in front of that breaking pitch, but just able to push it foul. Now he'll get another chance. Costas ready as Bees come set. And the 2-2 pitch. This one driven out towards center field. Moving back is Jamison Hanna. He's on the run. Looks like he has a beat on it, but that is plenty deep enough as A.J. Graffanino jogs home from third, and the Whitecaps take a one to nothing lead here in game number three of the Cape League Championship Series. Well, Costas did his job there. I know the fans would have been more electrified if he had uh, delivered a home run or something like that, but a sacrifice fly is just what you need. Right now, this game does not have the look of a game that's going to be filled with offense, and a sack fly to bring in a run like that is so important. And now Hunter Bishop digs in from the left side. Gasper remained at first on the sack fly. So two away, runner at first for the Whitecaps. They lead this one one to nothing. And the first pitch from Bees to Bishop. Fastball in for strike one. He's looking into the catcher, Susie, shakes off the first sign. Now gets what he wants, and the 0-1 pitch. Breaking ball misses off the play. The count levels one ball and one strike. Bishop struck out looking in his first at-bat. That ended the bottom of the first inning. As he awaits the 1-1 pitch, here it comes. Another breaking ball. This one misses high and outside, and Bishop now ahead in the count 2-1. Kyle Datris on deck for the Whitecaps, hoping to have a chance to bat here in the bottom of the third. As the 2-1 pitch from Bees, this one lined out towards right field, moving in his Witherspoon, but that one will drop in. Gasper round second, he's headed to third. The throw in is in time. A heck of a throw from Grant Witherspoon in right field to get Mickey Gasper trying to move from first to third, and that will end the bottom of the third. But the Whitecaps take a 1-0 lead. It comes on a Marty Costas sacrifice fly to center field, and after three innings at Stony Brook Field, it's 1-0 Whitecaps in game number three of the Cape League Championship Series. What's donated here stays here. All blood that is donated to Cape Cod Healthcare stays on Cape Cod to help the lives of your friends, family, and neighbors. To learn more about donating blood, platelets, or hosting a blood drive, visit capecodhealth.org slash bloodcenter. First pitch swinging for Lyle Lynn. He lines one in the right field for the first hit of the ball game for the Bourne Braves. Tribuker had a no-hitter going through three, but Lynn goes the opposite way for a leadoff single here in the fourth. Good piece of hitting there by Lyle Lynn. Got the first pitch fastball from Try Beaker on the outside part of the plate, and Lynn, even though, like we mentioned, he he's struggling a bit at the beginning of this playoffs, he's a very good hitter, and he had a great year at Arizona State this year. He's the guy who, when Harvey Shapiro got him onto this born roster, thought was going to be you know, the fixture in this born lineup, and he showed it there going the opposite way, just went with the pitch and lined it over Nick Dunn into right field. So here comes Triolo, the three-hitter and third baseman for Harvey Shapiro's team. He takes the first pitch low to make the count 1-0. We are starting the top of any number four, 
here at Stony Brook Field in this winner-take-all Game 3 of the Cape League Championship Series, and the home team has a 1-0 lead after the sack fly from Costas. It's 1-0 Whitecaps. Here comes the 1-0 pitch, fouled off behind the plate. Just barely got a piece off the end of the bat, it looked like, did Triolo. Triolo, until that Lyle Lynn single, was the first base runner that Bourne had in this ball game. He had a walk in the first inning, advanced on a pass ball to second, and then was uh, left hung out to dry after Hannah popped out to finish that first frame. Only time Bourne's got a runner to second in this game. 1-1 pitch is in there for a called strike on the outer edge, and the count is 1-2. and two. Triolo didn't look exactly thrilled with that call. But Mickey Garcia has pretty consistently been given that strike on the outside corner to righties and inside corner to lefties. 1-2 is the count. Tribuker staring in, looking for his fourth strikeout of the game. Now he's ready. He comes set. And here comes the 1-2. Fouled off to the right side. Tribuker looked like he wanted that one. Looked like he made the pitch. A good job by Triolo to get the bat on it. Lyle Lynn on first base. With nobody out here in the top of inning number four. Been a great day for the pitchers so far here at Stony Brook Field. The pitch to Triolo, nope, they're gonna go to first base, does Tribuker. And getting back without a slide is Lyle Lynn. So far, Lynn has not attempted to steal a base in these playoffs. Did have one in the regular season. Here comes the 1-2 pitch. It's at high in the air to right field. Chandler Taylor moving back and to his left, makes the catch hopping in the air. And that is out number one. Had to do a little bunny hop there, did the outfielder from Alabama. That was hit pretty hard right at him, but was able to track it down for out number one. Well, I don't know how many times we've said it this summer, Carter, but we always say the, for the hardest ball to read is the one hit right at you. And there, that one lined right towards Chandler Taylor, but a good job reacting to it. Again, as this game progresses, like you mentioned earlier on in this game, this, the sun's going to become more of a factor for Witherspoon and Taylor in right field, and a good job there battling it to put it away for out number one. So now it's Jamison Hanna's turn. The pitch to the left-handed hitter is a breaking ball that misses high and tight. Makes the count 0-1, or 1-0, excuse me, on Hanna. So far today, Hanna has that pop fly that I mentioned earlier. It was a great play from Kyle Datris to hustle into foul ground and make the catch. On the third base side, here comes the 1-0. Again, a breaking ball that misses on the inside. Part 2-0 is the count. Both of those pitches... Came up at eye level to Hannah before diving downward. Didn't quite hit the target. So 2-0 the count. We are in the top of the fourth inning of a 1-0 game. Whitecaps ahead here in game three. The pitch to Hannah is cut on and hit high in the air to right center field. Chandler Taylor coming in, but he'll play it on a hop. It's a base hit to right field. So a couple of little loopers toward the right side of the outfield, and it's first and second now for the Braves with one man out. And that's baseball at his finest. Triolo just crushes one to right field right at Chandler Taylor. It goes as an out. Hannah just kind of has a little bit of soft contact, jammed a little bit, and loops it into right field. He gets a hit. So it all evens out in the end, though. So now here comes Kevin Radzewicz. First and second, one man out. This is the closest that Bourne has come to scoring in this game. Tribuker checks the runner at second. Here's the pitch. It's hit on the ground foul, left side. That one careened off of the Brewster Whitecaps dugout. I think that took a piece of the roof of the dugout and a couple of coaches turning their heads to make sure everybody's all right in there. Looks like everything's going to be okay, but they're still looking in that part of the dugout. Can't quite see what's happening from our vantage point out here. And it looks like everything's going to be all right. The coaches will uh, return their attention to the action on the field as Jamie Shevchik, Ryan Smythe are all... The rest of the coaching staff all on the top step, as they have been for the previous 52 games of the year, and the pitch runs up and hits him on the outer arm up by the shoulder, so a hit-by-pitch sends Kevin Radzewicz to first and loads the bases with one out. Drybeaker trying to go inside with the fastball there to Radzewicz, try and jam him, generate some soft contact, potentially a double play ground ball, just ran it too far in and got the inside corner right on that left arm like you talked about, Carter. And now the bases are loaded, although it is a left-handed hitter coming up. So if you're Tribeaker, you do find some solace in that now it's a lefty-lefty matchup. And you've, we've talked about changing eye levels as well. Tribeaker's missed on three pitches in a row that were supposed to be high and tight to try and set up that fastball in the outer half that he likes to throw. The pitch is looped in the air off the bat. It's grounded to Raffinino. He throws the second for one on to first base. It's a double play. A terrific play from A.J. Graffinino to fill that one on one hop, flip it over to Dunn, and the 6-4-3 DP retires the side. Zach Susi 
sees one pitch and grounds into the twin killing. So it's no runs for Bourne in the fourth inning on two hits, and thanks to the double play, they leave just two runners on. At the end of three and a half innings of play, Whitecaps one, Braves nothing on the Whitecaps radio network. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wedeal and Aiden Doyle. Learning at Curry College extends beyond the classroom and is embedded in all that they do. Curry prepares students to engage in successful careers and active citizenship with a global perspective. Explore undergraduate majors, majors, minors, and concentrations, including new majors in accounting, biochemistry, and software development online at www.curry.edu. We welcome you back to Stony Brook Field, the site of this winner-take-all game three. Somebody's going to lift the Arnold Mycock Trophy here at Stony Brook Field at the end of this ball game, will it be Brewster or Bourne? Right now, the Whitecaps hang on to a 1-0 lead as we start the bottom of the fourth. It's going to be Datris, Taylor, and Hill due up for the Whitecaps. Those are the five, six, seven orders in the order for Jamie Shevchik. Datris grounded out to second his first time, and he will dig in a right-handed hitter against the righty Daniel Bees, who so far has looked pretty comfortable on the mound. The one Whitecaps run coming in on a sack fly from Costas. The pitch to Datris misses down and away, and the count is 1-0. and oh. Whitecaps got three hits in that third inning. We're just able to get the one run in. Here's the pitch to Datris. It's high and tight, so 2-0 is the count on the UNC Tar Heel. Mickey Gasper was the final out of that third frame, trying to hustle the third base on a single from Bishop and was tagged out. By a pretty big margin on the throw from the right fielder, Witherspoon. 2-0 pitch, cut on and missed. Datris took a rip at that one, but came up empty, and the count is 2-1. and one. Looked like he was well out in front of that offering from Bees. So Datris will take a deep breath as he settles back into the box. Two balls, one strike the count. Here comes the pitch from Bees. Cut on and missed again. So he fools Datris on back-to-back -back swings, and the count is 2-2 two and two now on Datris. But we'll now adjust the batting gloves and try and reset with another deep breath. Count even two and two. The righty bees is ready. Here's the pitch. Cut on and miss for strike three. That one tailing away and down to the righty hitter. So Datris swings and misses on three straight offerings from Bees and is retired on strikes. That's the fifth strike out of the game for Bees. Well, that was just a great sequence there by Bees. After falling behind 2-0, goes to the breaking ball twice for strikes, even though Datra swung and missed. They were both in the zone. And then with the 2-2 pitch, gets him to chase that breaking ball again, this time out of the zone. And a great, what if he had taken it, a great miss there by Bees, but was able after getting him to swing twice to get Datra's to chase. Here's Chandler Taylor, another breaking ball in there for a called strike from Bees to begin the at-bat for Taylor. And he has a couple of words with Mickey Garcia, but they both have an affirmative nod. 0-1 coming. Swing and a miss, strike two. Blew the fastball right by him. Great sequence early on in the at-bat from Bees. Started him off with that slow looping breaking ball in for a strike and then just uncorked the heater. The fastball is going to be... Low 90s for Bees, so not the fastest thing in the world, but after you see a breaking ball like that, it's a different story. The 0-2 pitch is another heater that misses up high. Bees shaking his head on the mound. That one slipped out of his hand, and so it's 1-2. and two. Now on Chandler Taylor. Taylor has swung and missed at a high fastball for strike three his first time. Here's the pitch. It misses low, so it's two balls and two strikes. As he tries to work his way back into the at-bat, Taylor saw 
A lot of pitches in his first at bat. Worked the count full before succumbing to the high heater. Here's the 2 2. It's foul back to the screen, so it's still 2 and 2 on Taylor. We're in the bottom of the fourth inning here at Stony Brook Field. The Cape Cod community here is converging on Stony Brook Field. I think we see even more folks who are here in this fourth inning than there were maybe six outs ago. 2 2 is the count on Taylor. Here's the pitch to the lefty. It's a breaking ball that misses outside. And the count is three and two. Looked like Susie was setting up down and in, and B's missing his spot, so three to the count again on Chandler Taylor for the second time in as many at-bats. Here comes the payoff pitch. Foul back to the screen. That was a fastball over the plate. Taylor looking at his bat, presses his face up against the kind of when he's examining it, right where the baseball made contact, knew he just missed it. So three and two still the count on Taylor. B's staring in, gets the sign from Zach Susie. Here's the 3-2 pitch. Up high for ball four. A terrific at-bat from Chandler. Taylor takes the high fastball this time for ball number four. Looked like that one might have been a little bit outside off the plate as well. And the Whitecaps have a base runner. There's a man on first base and one out. Yeah, that was a heck of an at-bat there. Well, a plate appearance from Chandler Taylor battling back. You know, he's a guy who has, a, has some swing and miss in his game, but he also walks a lot. He's a guy who sees a lot of pitches fouls a lot of pitches off, battles. He's a, he's a competitor up there, and he's not going to go down easily. So here's the lefty swinging Darius Hill. The pitch misses up high, and Zach Susi will ask for time and trot out to have a conversation with Daniel Bees. Does look like there is some action in the Bourne Braves bullpen. We talked a little bit about how the leash for Daniel Bees might be pretty short in this ball game. Blake Whitney is the right-hander warming up for the Bourne Braves, the man out of USC Upstate. So we'll see if Bees can work his way out of this fourth inning. Right now his team trails one to nothing. A sacrifice fly from Marty Costas in the third is the difference in this game. one nothing Whitecaps. As Hill will face a 1-0 pitch from Bees, who is ready. He holds the set. Here comes the 1-0 pitch. A chopper toward the right side. The second baseman Williams fields. Flips to second for one. On to first. It's a double play. So that's how you get out of a jam when you got another guy warming as Daniel Bees gets the pitcher's best friend, a 4-6-3 double play to retire the side in the bottom of the fourth. For Brewster in the fourth inning, no runs, no hits, no one left. At the end of four, the Whitecaps lead 1-0. You're listening to the Whitecaps Radio Network. Visit Star's Restaurant at Chatham Bar's Inn Resort and Spa for a world-class dining experience. A proud member of leading hotels of the world. We welcome you back. Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle here at Stony Brook Field, a packed house for this winner-take-all game three. And as the sun moves behind a cloud, casting a shadow over the field as we come back on the air, it's Tyler Fitzgerald leading things off for the Braves. Born trails in this game one to nothing as we start the top of the fifth. It's seven, eight, and nine due up for the Braves. Fitzgerald, Witherspoon, and Atwood. Fitzgerald, a righty against the lefty Tribuker, and the first pitch misses down and in. That one skipped in the dirt. Nice job by Gasper picking it up. 1-0 is the count on Fitzgerald, who struck out swinging his first time up. Sun comes back out. Here's the 1-0. It misses low, so it's two balls and no strikes. Now on Fitzgerald. Tribuker just two hits allowed. They both came in that fourth inning where Bourne loaded the bases. Here comes the 2-0 pitch. It misses down and away, so it's 3-0 and 
But a 6-4-3 double play able to get Tribuker out of trouble. Both sides turning double plays to end their respective fourth innings in this game. Here comes the 3-0 offering to Fitzgerald. In there for a called strike on the outer corner to make the count 3-1. and one. Double plays have been vital for Brewster. I remember that clincher against Orleans at Eldridge Park. The Whitecaps turned three double plays in the first three innings. The 3-1 pitch is hit high in the air towards shallow right center. The center fielder Bishop moves to his left, calls off Chandler Taylor, and makes the catch. So that's out number one of the top of the fifth. Nice job by Bishop to kind of direct traffic in that play as things get sunnier as the sun starts to come down. It could get a little bit trickier, especially out in right center field. But this defensive outfield for Brewster has been one of the highlights of this team throughout their playoff run. Here's Grant Witherspoon, a left-handed hitter. The pitch is hit high in the air but foul toward the left side and will tail out of play. Sailing over the Whitecaps bullpen. Witherspoon gazing at the ball as it went out of play. He Drove that one in plenty long way off the opposite field, but not in fair ground. So here's the 0-1 pitch. Cut on and missed strike two. A breaking ball from Tribuker had terrific movement. Maybe started up at the letters and finished up below the knees. And that Bender is working so far in this game for Will Tribuker, who will now take a moment to tie his left shoe on the mound. Tribuker, a guy who's always locked in. He's not going to show you a ton of emotion on the mound, but... Perhaps that's a sign, but he's pretty loose out there. Here comes the 0-2 pitch. Check swing, and he went around, says Mickey Garcia. So that's strike three. That one broke down and away to the lefty, and Grant Witherspoon is retired on strikes. That's four now for Tribuker in terms of punch outs in this ball game. That was just a great breaking ball there from Tribuker to the left-hander Witherspoon. Started off like looking on the inside part of the plate and just has so much. I know you're a big fan of this, Carter. Lateral movement there, breaking away from the lefty. Chased it way out of the zone. He couldn't have hit that with a telephone pole. So here's the righty Andy Atwood, and the left fielder takes a pitch inside, so it's 1-0. I know I like lateral movement. You like changing eye levels. We all like our, our certain things to watch, and we have a great viewpoint here where we are at Sony Brookfield. We're sitting right behind the scouts, and we can see the movement on these pitches. So far, Tribuker, for the most part, is doing a great job locating. Here's the 1-0 pitch to Atwood. He checks swings and fouls it off to the right side. He shakes his head, bit unlucky there for the nine hitter, so it's one and one. And for Tribuker, this is good to see for him if you're Jamie Shevchik after an ending where he struggled in the fourth to come right back out. I know it's against the bottom third of the lineup, but to come back out and get the first two guys in order. 1-1 one, one pitch, misses down and in. So it's two balls and one strike now on Andy Atwood. Atwood flew out to right field his last time. It was a great job by Taylor to run down that baseball. 2-1 pitch. In there called strike two on the outer edge. Tribuker has been working that outside corner a lot. You know, if, if you'd think he was Tony Losi with the number of times he's going there. That's one of Losi's favorite pitches, the outside corner to the righty. 2-2 two -two pitch. Just misses low, and the count is full. Tribuker thought he had strike three. He took a couple of steps over toward the dugout. In fact, the Whitecaps infield, you could kind of see, took maybe a half step over toward the third base side where the Whitecaps dugout is. But it's three and two, and here comes the payoff pitch. A slow ground ball left side, scooped up by Kyle Datris. He throws across the diamond in time to retire the side. So Will Tribuker gets a 1-2-3 top of the fifth inning for the Whitecaps. We're already halfway through regulation ball game here in this winner-take-all game three, and the Whitecaps lead 1-0. You're listening to Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wedeal and Aiden Doyle. We're back at Stony Brook Field in Brewster where the Whitecaps are still hanging on to a 1-0 lead. We're starting the bottom of the fifth inning. The Whitecaps will have Infante, Graffinino, and then the top of the order and Nick Dunn do up against the Bourne Braves here in the bottom of the fifth, and they will not be doing it against Daniel Bees. A new pitcher has been called upon by Harvey Shapiro. It is Blake Whitney, the man who was warming earlier for the Braves, the righty out of South Carolina upstate. This is just the third appearance that he has made in a Braves uniform, second of the playoffs, and he had a terrific start the last time he saw action in game two against the Gateman through six innings of shutout baseball. Here comes the first pitch to the righty, Julian Infante. It's cut on and missed for strike one as Infante was out in front of it. Now six innings of shutout ball. It's a good start, but for Bourne, it really is exceptional. It's the only time a Bourne starter has gone six innings this year and just the third time at the time that the starter had gone without giving up a run. Here comes the 0-1 pitch to Infante. It skips him a dirt low and outside. So the count is one ball and one strike on the Vanderbilt Commodore. Infante was caught swinging on a breaking ball his first time up against Bees, who went four innings, gave up four hits, one earned run, one walk and five Ks. The pitch is hit hard, left side. The third baseman scoops it up. Nice play over there by Triolo. He throws across the diamond in time for the out. A one hopper. They don't call it the hot corner for nothing. Triolo moving his glove over to his left side. The right-handed third baseman just picking that one up off the dirt like a first baseman would on a hard throw. So Infante is retired 5-3. Yeah, heck of a play on the short hop there by Triolo, and that's going to be a little bit of bad luck for Julian Infante, you know, struggling a little bit at the plate coming into that at-bat, struck out swinging his first appearance on three pitches, and there, hits one hard, and nine times out of ten, that's a base hit, but Triolo able to glove it. That's just the way things are going right now for Infante. Here's Graffinino. He bunts it toward the left side foul. That one gets wide of third. Graffinino was hustling over, got all the way to first base, didn't even look to see if it stayed in fair territory trying to catch the third baseman, Triolo, off guard. So Graffinino, when he grabs his bat again, will be behind him to count 0-1. Graffinino has reason to be confident in beating out an infield hit. That's what he did his first time up. Hit a little 11 hopper toward the left side in the shortstop hole. And Fitzgerald, the shortstop, made a great effort to try and throw him out, but to no avail. He later scored on the sacrifice fly to Graffinino for the Whitecaps' only run and the only run of this 1-0 game. Here comes the 0-1 pitch. It misses down and in. Makes the count one ball and one strike on A.J. Graffinino. Whitney was in the NECBL before he came here to Bourne. That's why he's only got the two appearances. 1-1 one, one pitch. Checks his swing on a pitch that was low. They appeal to third, and he did not go, says Rick Del Vecchio over at third base. Susie wanted the appeal. The catcher actually gestured toward first base the first time, and then Mickey Garcia of the home play dump. Corrected him, said, no, we're going to third. We got a lefty hitter. 2-1 is the count on Graffinino. Here comes the pitch from Whitney. Just a bit low as well that time. Graffinino laying that one off without the check. So 3-1 and one is the count. Whitney wearing 33 for Bourne. Has nice long brown locks coming out of his cap. Reminds you of some of the young guns over on the Mets. DeGrom, Syndergaard, that sort of hairdo. 3-1 pitches it high in the air to right field toward the foul line, and it's foul. That one was hit hard by A.J. Graffinino, but wound up landing maybe 10 feet toward the foul side of that right field line in front of the Bourne Braves bullpen. That was a great piece of hitting, and again, Graffinino will saunter back over to the batter's box. You, you mentioned the hair on Whitney Carter, and when he first came out there, that's what I was trying to think of. I'm like, who's a comparison for him? And the first person that came to mind was Syndergaard, but I'm like, no, that's a little bit straighter, and mm -hmm. it's blonde, whereas right. Whitney has br uh, brown hair. Then I'm like, well, why leave the Mets? Jacob DeGrom's right there. That's the perfect hair comparison for Blake Whitney. Here comes the 3-2 pitch to Graffinino. It is in there for a called strike three. Whitney froze him on a breaking ball, and that's out number two of the bottom of the fifth. A terrific payoff pitch there from Whitney. Yeah, that one was very sharp. Started outside and then some late movement there to come in and catch the outside corner. And now with two outs and nobody on the top of the lineup, whereas if A.J. Graffinino had been able to walk there, battle back, or get a hit or something, then you have a runner on in the top of the lineup coming up. So here comes Nick Dunn. The pitch to the lefty is another breaking ball that misses up high in the judgment of Garcia behind the plate. So 1-0 the count on Dunn, who has reached base once in this game. Here comes the pitch. 
just misses outside. Susie did his best to frame that. Tried to yank it in, but no dice. That might have been a call that Bourne got last night in Bourne, but not today. Here comes the 2-0 pitch. Misses up high, so it's 3-0. That one beyond framing from Susie. So Nick Dunn in a position that he has to like a lot, 3-0 the count. Usually we see Nick Dunn working well from behind him the count. Here comes the 3-0 pitch. It's in there for a strike. Dunn taking all the way, as one would expect. And the count is 3-1. and one. Dunn drew a walk in the first inning, but then was first pitch swinging, flew out to left in the third. 3-1 offering. In there for a called strike two. Nice frame on the outer edge that time from Susie. So it's a full count on Dunn. We're in the bottom of the fifth inning. Whitecaps ahead 1-0. Here in this deciding game three of the Cape Cod League Championship Series. Here comes the 3-2 pitch. Grounded foul right side. A chopper over toward the Braves' dugout on the first base side, whacked off the screen. So it's still three balls and two strikes on Dunn, who digs back in with an affirmative smack of the baseball bat on home plate. Here comes the payoff pitch from Whitney. Grounded toward the right side, right to the first baseman, Lynn, who does a nice job to scoop it and go to the bag himself to retire the side. So Brewster goes down 1-2-3 in the fifth inning. Haven't seen a base runner in this ball game in a while. It's 1-0 Whitecaps at the end of five. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball. Here are Carter Wedeal and Aiden Doyle. We're back at game three. Bourne has the top of the order due up in the top of the six. Williams, Lynn, and Triolo. The Braves are behind in this ball game, one nothing. Here comes the first pitch from Tri Buker, lefty to lefty. It misses well low. It skipped in front of the plate, maybe went 59 and a half feet there. And Gasper was able to collect it, so one ball and no strike on the Braves' second baseman. Here comes the 1-0 pitch. Again, misses low. The count is 2-0. Tribuker kind of hung his head there after that offering. Perhaps a sign that he wasn't a fan of the release point on that pitch. Here comes the 2-0 pitch. It's it high in the air, a pop fly to shallow center field. Coming in is Bishop, but he's called off by the shortstop, Graffinino, who makes the catch a few steps into the outfield grass for out number one. Good job there by Tribuker, forcing some soft contact there from the leadoff man. And as Tommy Weber always likes to say, the first out's the most important out. You get that first out, if you, or in the other, flipping it around, if you allow the leadoff man to reach, it becomes a lot more difficult as a pitcher. And it's even more important when you've got the top of the order due up as they do in this inning. So I totally agree with that, Aiden. Here is Lyle Lynn, the two-hitter. Here comes the pitch to the righty. It's a breaking ball that dives down low to make the count 0-1. Oh, a terrific take there from Lynn, as that was an excellent pitch from Tribuker. So the count's 0-1 on Lynn. Drybuker's working quickly. Here's the 0-1 offering. Hit high in the air. Another pop fly left side of the infield. Racing in as the third baseman, Datris, and he's called off by Graffinino, who makes the catch to the right side of the pitcher's mound. A great job by Graffinino hustling in, directing traffic. Nick Dunn, the second baseman, was right there as well. But Graffinino, charging in from short, decided he was the man to grab it, call for it. And so a couple of pop flies means it's two outs here in the top of any number six. And very different pop flies, although they both ended up in the glove of A.J. Graffinino. The first one at the shallow center field. That one racing in all the way almost to the right of the pitcher's mound, so on the first base, second base side of the field, and 
a whole lot of white caps converge on on that one. So here's Triolo. He hits one high in the air to left center field. Moving back is Hunter Bishop, still heading back, and that one is a one hopper, and Bishop will field it, cutting it off in the left center field gap. Re heading into second base with a standing double is Triolo. That was tattooed out to left center. It was a great job by Bishop to get to it before it hit the wall, but nevertheless, it's a two bagger for Triolo, and the Braves have a man in scoring position and two out. Well, Triolo was all over that first pitch fastball from Tribuker, trying to throw that first pitch strike at ahead of hitters like he's been doing all out in. And he just left, let that one catch a little bit too much of the heart of the plate. And Triolo, a good hitter. There's a reason he's batting in the three spot for Bourne. Mm -hmm. Jumped all over it and drove it out to left center. Very impressed with the velocity off of his bat this entire series from Triolo. So here's the cleanup hitter, Jamison Hanna. Lefty to lefty. The first pitch to him misses downstairs again. Seems like Tribuker is having a little bit of trouble throwing strike one. Missing low a little bit to these hitters. Perhaps the second time through the order, or now the third time here as this game is moving quickly. The 1-0 to Hanna is hit hard on the ground, left side. Graffinino moves to his right, fields it, double clutches, and throws to first base. It's not in time, and Infante drops the baseball. That was a tough pick for Infante in the dirt. Just couldn't quite hang on to the ball. Not sure if he would have been out even if Infante had maintained possession, but... Either way, there's a runner on first base. Staying at second, importantly, is Triolo. So it's first and second and two men out for Radzewicz. Yeah, that was very similar to A.J. Graffanino's infield mm -hmm. hit. Not quite as hard as Graffanino's, but a, you know, a speedy left-handed batter, so you're already quicker to first base hitting from the left side and you know, running down to first base. I, don't, I, don't, I think even if Infante gloves that, it's probably an infield single for Hanna. So two on, two out. The pitch to the righty, Radzewicz, is dropped in for strike number one. Count 0-1. Whitecaps ahead one to nothing here in the top of the sixth inning. You know, it's unusual for Graffinino to double clutch a baseball. Not sure how many times we've seen that from him. He's got such quick hands at short. Does a great job of picking the ball off the dirt, making that transfer. That's really his best attribute as a defensive player. 0-1 the count to the righty Radzewicz the pitch. Misses down and in. So the count is 1-1 one one. so far today for Radzewicz. Has reached base, but in the more painful way to do it was hit by a pitch on the, ar on the arm. Up toward the shoulder, that was in the fourth inning. Loaded the bases, but the Braves failed to score. Zach Susi followed up the hit by pitch with a double play ground ball to retire the side. 1-1 one, one pitch. Misses just a bit low, and the count is 2-1. and one. Some affirmative shouts from the direction of the Braves' dugout. Not sure if it was fans or folks in the dugout or both, but there are quite a few born Braves supporters on the first base side where the visitors' dugout is here at Stony Brook Field. Waiting on a 2-1 pitch from the lefty Tribuker. Here it comes. It misses outside. Snap throw to first base, and he is safe at first, diving back in time. Infante did a great job bringing that tag down, and Gasper showing some courage, firing the snap throw over. But getting back in time is Hanna. So it's three balls and one strike now on Radzewicz. one nothing. Brewster is on top in this ball game with two men out in the top of the sixth. Bourne trying to level the score right here. The 3-1 pitch is a chopper left side. No, it's a foul ball. They're going to say it hit a part of Radzewicz's body. That might have caught him on the foot. So it's waved dead by the home plate umpire, Mickey Garcia. They'll give Tribuker a new baseball, and the count will be full with two men out, which means the runners are going to be going here on this next offering. Radzewicz will take a second to collect himself, take a practice swing. He's ready to go, and Tribuker will now Talk with Mickey Gasper as Gasper is hustling out to have a conversation with Tribuker. Looks like a hurler just got up on the Whitecaps bullpen. It's Joe Demiers out there for Brewster, who has just begun getting loose for the Caps. Just a batter or two ago. First and second, two men out. Count full on Kevin Radzewicz, one of the bigger pitches of this ball game so far here in game three. Here comes the pitch. Nope, he's going to check the runner at second and step off the mound. So we'll wait a little bit longer for the offering from the lefty Tribuker. And Radzewicz will kick some clay out of his cleats and get back in the batter's box. Tribuker holds the set, and the 3-2 pitch coming. Fouled away, right side, and we'll do it again. Looks like the first base coach, Vince Redman, as he was watching that baseball fly for Bourne, kind of bent his knees a little bit. He knew that Kevin Radzewicz nearly got enough wood on that baseball to try and drive in a run. Braves trailing in this game 1-0 here in this winner-take-all game three in front of a packed house at Stony Brook Field. Tribuker gets the sign he likes from Gasper. Here's the 3-2 offering. 
It's it high in the air towards shallow right field, charging in his Taylor. He slides and he makes the catch. A terrific catch from Chandler Taylor going to the ground, and that retires the side here in the top of the sixth inning. Chandler Taylor is excited as he jogs back into the dugout. All his teammates are there. Will Tribuker is there and gives him a nice pat on the rear end as he heads into the dugout. You can tell how much this game means to Taylor, to Tribuker, and to this entire Whitecaps team. Brewster leads 1-0 after 5.5. No runs, two hits, two left for the Braves in the sixth. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network. We welcome you back to Stony Brook Field. A terrific play from Chandler Taylor in right field to end that top of the six. And for a little bit more on Taylor, let's go to Mora. Thanks, guys. Well, I actually talked to Jamie Shevchik about Chandler Taylor and his defense, and Shevchik says that Taylor is one of the most underrated outfielders in the Cape. We've seen him throw out a guy in this series with a nice throw to throw out a run coming home. We just saw two nice catches from Chandler Taylor today alone. And so Jamie Shevchik says, he loves when he sees Chandler Taylor make a good catch out there because it gets him pumped, it gets the team pumped, but it also shows the scouts that are here that Chandler Taylor has a lot more to offer than just a hot bat. Back to you guys. Thank you, Mora. And you're right. I mean, Chandler Taylor, he's got speed and he's got a great arm in the outfield. I mean, there's not a lot more you could ask for in that situation. Obviously, with the uh, range and getting to baseballs, you know, it, it's been a, a great season for him, and it's funny because that's not the only tool that's kind of neglected. I mean, Chandler Taylor has a reputation on a guy, as a guy who can just pummel the baseball, but he can run on the base pass as well. So here's Mickey Gasper, the first pitch to the switch hitter batting left-handed. is in there for a called strike at the knees. Gasper keeps his mouth shut, but is clearly unhappy with the call with Mickey Garcia. 2-3-4 and four due up for the Whitecaps as they try to get the momentum going here. The 0-1 pitch to Gasper is a breaking ball in there for a strike, so the count is 0-2. The score is 1-0. Brewster is ahead. A sack fly from Marty Costas in the bottom of the third was what put that run across. A.J. Graffinino came in to score. 0-2 to Gasper. He is up high. So it's one ball and two strikes. Whitney's still on the mound. For the Braves, here's the 1-2 pitch. In there for a called strike three. A terrific slurvy breaking ball there from Whitney that dove into the part of the plate after starting off up and away so Gasper is down looking you don't see that too often that's out number one Whitney's showing off some pretty good stuff here you know he comes from a small school in the University of South Carolina upstate so not exactly one a lot of people have heard of the first pitch to Marty Costas is off the plate outside so it's 1-0 and but he's showing off good stuff I mean it doesn't matter where you go whether it be Vanderbilt or Florida or University of South Carolina Upstate. The 1-0 pitch is a breaking ball that didn't have a ton of bite to it. Misses up high, so the count is two balls and no strikes on the Maryland Terrapin, Marty Costas, who has the lone ribby of this game. 1-0 Whitecaps in the bottom of the sixth. 2-0 pitch. Is it high in the air to center field? Moving back is Hannah. It's playable for him there. Now comes in a couple of steps and makes the grab in straightaway center for out number two. This is a, a ballpark here at Stony Brook Field. We're so used to seeing the wind blow out that when somebody gets a baseball a mile high like that, you think it's going to push him back to the warning track. But today, a really just kind of a perfect in a vacuum condition. We got partly cloudy, 70s weather, and no wind. It's kind of the weather that you would want for a must-win, winner-take-all championship game. Not going to interfere too much with the field of play. But in any case, Costas is now retired. So here's Bishop. The first pitch is in there for a called strike to Hunter Bishop, who's hitting from the left side. Bishop singled his last time up, but had to go right back to the dugout as Gasper was tagged out on third of the same play. 0-1 pitch hit high in the air to left field. Moving over is the left fielder Andy Atwood toward the foul line, and that one is out of here! It gets over the left field wall, tucked inside the foul pole in left field, and Hunter Bishop, with his third home run of the playoffs, has doubled the Whitecaps lead. It's now 2-0 Brewster on a solo shot from Bishop. Third home run of the playoffs and third one to opposite field for Hunter Bishop. He is seeing the ball so well. He had a hard hit single, and this Whitecaps team, this Whitecaps crowd is pumped 
up right now at Stony Brook Field. Boy, that looked like uh, you were talking about the similarities with Bishop's homers. That looked a lot like the one that he healed at Eldridge Park where it just kept carrying and carrying and just snuck inside the foul ball. It's 3.15 out to left field here at Stony Brook Field. And so Bishop makes it this a 2-0 game. The only white cap now with three home runs in the postseason. The first pitch to Kyle Datris. Misses low. He checked his swing, but he didn't go around. Says Nick DeMarkey over at first base. And that puts a jolt into this ballpark here as well with the fans. The pitch to the righty Datris is in there for a called strike one. 1-1 one, one the count on Datris, who's 0 for 2. Hunter Bishop was showing a ton of emotion as he came in after that home run, taking his helmet off, high-fiving his teammates, shouting. Here comes the 1-1 one, one pitch. It's in there for a called strike. Another off-speed offering there from Blake Whitney. And so it's one ball and two strikes on Kyle Datris. And here comes the 1-2 righty to righty. Soft ground ball toward the right side, charging is the second baseman Williams. He scoops it, throws to first in time for out number three of the sixth inning. So the Whitecaps get the one run on the big blow, the solo shot from Hunter Bishop, and they double their lead. It's now 2-0. One run, one hit, and nobody left on base. Aiden Doyle will take us home right after this. You're listening to the Brewster Whitecaps Radio Network. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle. It'll be seven, eight, or six, seven, eight, excuse me, in the Bourne lineup due up here in the top of the seventh inning. First pitch from Will Tribuker to Zach Susie. Misses inside for ball one. Two to nothing to score. Whitecaps lead the Braves as this one's chopped towards second. Looks like a broken bat fielded by Nick Dunn and an easy throw on the first base for out number one here in the top of the seventh. Aiden Doyle alongside Carter Wadeel on the Whitecaps radio network. The Whitecaps getting their second run of the game in the last inning. Bottom of the sixth inning, a two-out opposite field home run. A solo shot off the bat of Hunter Bishop. His third opposite field home run of the playoffs. And now Will Tribuker into his seventh inning of work for the Whitecaps. Now Tyler Fitzgerald digging in. Looks at a first pitch fastball from Tri Buker on the outside corner for strike number one. Tri Buker through the windup. A one pitch. A breaking ball misses downstairs. He peeled down to the first base umpire Nick DeMarkey. Says he held up. And the count levels at one and one. Ryan Buecher looking into Gasper, gets what he wants, and the 1-1 pitch. Big looping breaking ball that just misses off the outside edge. Now 2-1 the count on Fitzgerald. Born shortstops 0-2 today. Struck out swinging in his first at-bat before flying out to center for the first out of the fifth. 2-1 pitch on its way. Cut on and missed. Looked like a change up there from Tri Buecher. Chased it up in the zone, and the count now 2-2. Two and two. Fitzgerald, right-handed hitting shortstop out of Louisville. Digs back in after taking a second to collect himself. Fastball from Tri Buecher just misses below the knees, and the count runs full. Some oohs and ahs from the Whitecap side of the field here at Stony Brook Field. Wanted that call, but Mickey Garcia said it missed below the knees. And so now it's a full count on the Bourne shortstop. 
Drive Eaker through the windup, payoff pitch, driven out to right field, but slicing foul and out of play. So we'll do it again here in Brewster. Gerald once again takes a second to step out of the box. And the payoff pitch from Shrivebuker. This one roped right back up the middle and into center field for a base hit. Shrivebuker tried to get a glove on it, but it had to duck out of the way. And now it's a one-out single for Fitzgerald. Talking about oohs and ahs. They went through the ballpark when that went through Shrivebuker. I know he wishes that he got the glove on it, but a good job to get out of the way because that was a comebacker. Now Grant Witherspoon, left-handed hitting right fielder for the Braves, steps in from the left side. Runner at first is Tyler Fitzgerald. One out here in the top of the seventh inning. Two to nothing to score. Whitecaps on top of the Braves. And the first pitch from Tribuker misses outside for ball one. Witherspoon out of Tulane University. Originally from Lakewood, Colorado. Going into his junior season with Tulane. Takes a 1-0 fastball from Tribuker. This one misses high and outside. Now 2-0. Lefty lefty matchup as Tribuker looks into Gasper. Now comes set as Fitzgerald leads off first. 2 0 pitch on its way. This one grooved in for a strike on the outside corner. Now 2 and 1 on Witherspoon. Tribuker staring into Gasper. Comes set. 2 1 pitch. Fastball just misses high and outside. Gasper tried to frame it there, but Mickey Garcia. Says it missed the zone, now 3-1 and one on Witherspoon. Whitecaps at double play depth as Infante holds on Fitzgerald. Drive Buker set, and the 3-1 pitch on its way. This one lifted in the air towards the left field line, but it will drop foul and over the dugout, so the count full on Witherspoon. Witherspoon steps back into the box. Tribuker holds the set. And the payoff pitch. Another one fouled off behind home plate over the backstop, and the count stays full. Good job by Witherspoon here, battling against Tribuker. Full count, one out, runner at first for the Braves. They trail two to nothing in this game, number three. Winner take all of the Cape League Championship Series. Payoff pitch from Tribuker. Another one fouled off. This one's straight back in front of us behind home plate. And we'll do it again. That'll wake you up, right? Straight back. A little bit closer to you, a little bit to my left as you're positioned. That's true. Two people away from me. So I would have been fine there. But if this netting gave way. That's a good enough sign for Witherspoon that he timed it well. Payoff pitch from Tribeaker. And he swings and misses at the breaking ball down and away. He got away from Gasper for a second. But a good job to keep it in front of him. And with first base occupied, there will be no throw down to first. Witherspoon down swinging for out number two in the seventh. And that's got to feel great for Will Tribuker. Has a couple of calls in that at-bat that he didn't agree with from Mickey Garcia and then winds up getting Witherspoon swinging on a pitch that wasn't even close to being a strike. I mean, that was in the dirt in the other batter's box, but it had enough movement. And since it was a two-strike count, Witherspoon was trying to protect the plate, but he was able to get strike three. And now Jamie Shevchik will walk out to the mound. Haven't seen a signal yet. Although, like you mentioned, Carter, Demiers was warming. Talking to Tribuker, the entire infield and Gasper joins him on the mound. And now it looks like we will get a signal. And it looks like it's Joe Demiers coming in for the Brewster Whitecaps. So it looks like Will Tribuker's day is done after six and two-thirds innings. Demiers will come in and face Andy Atwood, the number nine hitter for the Brewster Whitecaps, and Will Tribuker is getting a standing ovation here at Stony Brook Field as he jogs off the mound. <laughs> Greeted immediately by his teammates, Tony Losey, Zach Gahagan, Joe Molitier, and the Brewster coaching staff. And that's a heck of an outing for Will Tribuker here in game number three. We'll take a short break as Joe Demiers comes in and throws his warm-up pitches. But we're coming down the final stretch of the Cape Cod League season. I wouldn't want to go anywhere, so I suggest, suggest you don't. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
Well, it's a new pitcher for the Whitecaps. It is Joe Namiers, and it's a pinch hitter for the Bourne Braves. It's Richie Palacios taking over for Andy Atwood. Runner at first, two outs, top of the seventh inning, and Demiers grooves in a first pitch fastball for strike one. Palacios, the number nine hitter now in this Bourne order. Out of Towson University. Left-handed hitter against the right-handed throw in Demiers. Demiers comes set. And the 0-1 pitch, this one lifted in the air down the left field line, giving chases Marty Casas, but this one will drop out of play beyond the Whitecaps' dugout, and the count now 0-2. Palacios batting just 125 in these playoffs in five games, two for 16. Demir's ready, comes set. And the 0-2 pitch. Another one fouled back, straight back behind home plate and over the press box. So the count stays 0 and 2. 2 to nothing to score. Whitecaps lead the Braves. Two outs, top of the seventh inning. Game three of the Cape League Championship Series. Demiers checks the runner at first. Now ready. And the 0-2 pitch. Fastball misses high above the letters for ball one. I tell you what, that was a miss, but that was a good miss from Joe Demiers because that was a, an enticing high heater there. Nice job by Palacios to lay it off. Tyler Fitzgerald leads off of first. Demiers checks him. Now comes set. And the righty deals a 1-2 pitch. Runner goes. Fastball misses outside. The throw from Gasper. Not in time as Fitzgerald swipes second. Didn't get a great jump there, did Fitzgerald. The throw was a little bit offline from Gasper. But a nice job picking the spot. So now a runner in scoring position for the Braves. Two and two the count on Richie Palacios. Demiers ready. And the 2-2 pitch. Fastball misses high and inside, and Palacios, after falling behind 0-2, battles back to a full count. And that's a very important stolen base. I mean, that's the first one that Fitzgerald's gotten in this postseason, and now he's taking an aggressive lead at second. Demiers ready. Staring in the Gasper and the payoff pitch. Fastball just misses outside, and Palacios works a walk. That was kind of interesting, the reaction from Palacios. He took a step toward first base, but also looked back at the umpire, Mickey Garcia, to make sure it was indeed ball four. So he was able to get it. And so now, top of the order coming up, Joe Demiris has been thrown right into the fire here. Like you mentioned, Carter, it is Grant Williams, the leadoff hitter for the Braves, stepping in. And I think part of the reason Palacios looked back is there were some oohs and ahs from the Whitecaps mm -hmm. side of the field. So he thought maybe Garcia called that a strike and just looked back to make sure. First pitch from Williams, or to Williams, looped down the left field line. That one will drop just foul. And the count now 0-1. Williams, the leadoff hitter and second baseman for Bourne, batting in a big spot for the Braves. Runners at first and second. Two outs, top of the seventh inning. Two to nothing to score. Brewster on top. Lyle Lynn waiting on deck for Bourne. It's a right-hander, Demiers. Comes set. And the 0-1 pitch. This one lifted in the air. Foul territory, giving chase is Mickey Gasper, but it will drop out of play to our left, and the count now 0-2. Mickey Garcia signals for four new baseballs from the Whitecaps Bat Boys as Williams gathers himself outside of the batter's box, now digs back in. Jasper giving the signs to Demiers, gets what he wants. Comes set, and deals 0-2. Fastball again fouled off over the third base dugout and out of play. Asher Woods jogs out from the Whitecaps on deck circle, delivers those four new baseballs to Mickey Garcia. Now retreats back to the Brewster dugout. 0-2 the count, two outs. Two runners on for Bourne. Two to nothing to score, Whitecaps lead. Top of the seventh inning. Demiers ready. And the 0-2 pitch. Goes to the breaking ball and misses off the plate. Now 1-2 and two on Williams. Cheers ringing out from the Whitecaps side of the dugout, encouraging Joe Demiers, trying to tell him to go get him. 1-2 pitch on its way. This one fouled straight back. Again, Carter, if the netting wasn't there, your glasses would be broken. 
But again, it means that a born hitter timed it really well and just wasn't quite able to get the wood to the horse tied enough to try and get a, an RBI hit. One ball, two strikes on Williams. Right-hander Demir's ready. And the pitch. Breaking ball, another one fouled back into the netting behind home plate, and the count stays one and two. Williams doing an excellent job battling in this at-bat. One ball, two strikes, two outs. Demir's comes set, checks the runner at second. And the pitch. Fastball hit on the ground, gloved by a diving Kyle Datris. He dives for third, and he's unable to make the... Fitzgerald slid in safely. Datris tried to tag the base with his glove, and Fitzgerald was able to get there just out in front. And so now the bases are loaded for Lyle Lynn. Oh, and you could see the emotion on Kyle Datris's face. I think it was a good call from Rick Del Vecchio over at third. But we've seen so many, I mean, how many times in the playoffs have we seen Kyle Datris make a nice play over at third when he's charging in? And that time had the presence of mind to think, okay, the best play probably, considering Grant Williams has a ton of speed, and it's going to be a tough across the diamond throw, is to go and try and just dive to the base bag. Got his uniform dirty, but has nothing to show for it. And now, who else but Lyle Lynn in the big spot for the Braves? Lynn, first baseman out of Arizona State. Demir's through the windup in the first pitch. Fastball misses in the dirt for ball one. Datris did a heck of a job gloving that ball in the first place as it was hit hard off the bat of Williams down the third base line. Datris was able to make the stab as Demir's through the windup in the 1-0 pitch. Fastball misses down and away, and Lynn ahead in the count 2-0. Bases loaded, two outs, two to nothing to score, Whitecaps lead. Demir's through the windup and the 2-0 pitch. This fastball finds a zone for strike one, in at the knees, says Mickey Garcia. Two balls, one strike, two outs, bases loaded. Righty, righty matchup as Demir's through the windup and the pitch. Fastball fouled off by Lynn back behind home plate, and the count levels at 2-2. Two and two. It's Fitzgerald off of third, Palacios off second, Williams off first. Demir shakes off Gaspard, now gets what he wants, and the 2-2 pitch. Fastball outside corner, just misses says Mickey Garcia. The Whitecaps fans wanted that one. So did Joe Demers. And so now the count is full on Lyle Lynn. No place to put him as the bases are loaded. It's going to start the merry-go-round as well. Tying run at second base for Bourne. Demers looking into Gasper. Runners go and the payoff pitch. Fastball driven out the left field. Going back is Marty Costas. He's on the run. He's at the track looking, turning, and he makes the catch! He makes the catch. He dives and makes the catch at the warning track. Marty Costas robs Lyle Lynn of a potential go-ahead double, and that ends the top of the seventh inning. Marty Costas saves the day in the top of the seventh for the Brewster Whitecaps. What a play from the Maryland Terrapin, and it's time to stretch in Brewster with the Whitecaps still leading two to nothing.
Moving to the bottom of the seventh inning, it's two to nothing Whitecaps as Chandler Taylor digs in from the left side. In case you're just joining us, you missed probably at this point the play of the year for the Brewster Whitecaps. Marty Costas in left field robbed Lyle Lynn of an extra base hit as the first pitch to Taylor, a breaking ball that misses down and in. The bases were loaded. It was a full count and two outs. Lynn crushed the ball to left center field. Costas ranging to his left, dove and made the play at the warning track. 1-0 pitch to Taylor. Fastball misses high. Now 2-0 on the Alabama Crimson Tide outfielder. Taylor today 0 for 1, did reach on a walk, and lifts this one high in the air out towards left. Newborn left fielder Richie Palacios at the track at the wall, and he makes the catch just in fair territory at the warning track. Chandler Taylor comes up about 5 to 10 feet of a, sh of a solo home run there, and now it's Darius Hill digging in for Brewster. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that was right where Hunter Bishop's baseball went. I didn't think that ball was going out when Bishop hit it, but... Kind of gives you a little bit more of a hold your breath sort of situation for everybody here at the ballpark. But a nice job by, as you said, the new guy, Palacios, out there and left after pinch hitting for Atwood to track down the baseball. Now Darius Hill at the, at the plate looks at a first pitch fastball for Whitney on the inside corner for strike one. Hill left-handed hitting a hitter out of West Virginia. Awaits the 0-1 pitch, breaking ball. This one roped right back up the middle and into center field. Let me tell you, Carter, that ball broke a ton. It looked like a wiffle ball out of the hand of Whitney, and I don't know how Darius got even saw that and just roped it right back up the middle, right where it came from, into center field for a one-out single. Tell you what, it looked just like a wiffle ball when it was hit, too. It had that curvature to it. It reminds you of being in the backyard, but... Now for Brewster, how many times in this postseason, in this Cinderella run, have we talked about the importance of insurance runs? Chance for the Whitecaps to get one in this frame. Now Julian Infante steps in, first pitch swinging, and swings through a fastball from Whitney for strike one. Hill now two for three on the day with a pair of singles, one to left, one to center, as Infante... Fixes his batting gloves, digs back in from the right side. Righty, righty matchup as Hill leads off first. And the 0-1 pitch to Infante. Caught on and missed, swung through a fastball there, now 0-2. Both bullpens are active right now. Miller is warming for the Caps, and Sean Leland is warming for the Braves. So we could perhaps have a changing of the guard, though I would imagine if, if I were Jamie Shevchuk, I would want Joe Demers to go as long as he can. Maybe that's just more if Joe Demers runs into trouble than they have Troy Miller in their back pocket. 0-2 the count on Infante, and he chases a breaking ball downstairs for a strike three. Infante now 0 for 3 on the day with a pair of strikeouts, and A.J. Graffanino, the number nine hitter, step into the plate. And it really seems like those breaking pitches have stymied Infante during this bit of a slump that he's had in this postseason. The other pitcher to keep an eye on, obviously, in the bullpen is Sam Bordner. I remember when we were talking to Coach Shevchuk after the game yesterday in the postgame show, he said he brought up this situation. If the same situation arose, he would bring Bordner in to finish the game. A.J. Graffinino now lifts one in the air out towards left. Palacios moving in and towards the line. Makes the play for out number three. So no runs for the Whitecaps in the bottom of the seventh. On They do get a hit, but Hill stranded at first, and we head to the eighth inning with the Whitecaps still leading 2 to nothing here in Game 3 of the Cape League Championship Series. You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
Back in Brewster for the top of the eighth inning, and there's a new pitcher for the Brewster Whitecaps. It's Troy Miller, the right-hander out of the University of Michigan, taking over on the mound for the Whitecaps, and he'll face 3-4-5 and five in this Braves order. 2-0 to nothing to score, Whitecaps on top of the Braves here in Game 3 of the Cape League Championship Series. Miller will face the righty, Jared Triolo, in his first pitch. Fastball then misses inside for ball one. Hey, baseball fans, please do not go to the 50-50 table and ask for the numbers as they're still counting the checker. Triolo today, one for two, reached on a walk in his first plate appearance. And the 1-0 pitch on its way. This fastball paints the outside corner, and the count evens at one and one. Miller, one of two Michigan Wolverines on this Brewster Whitecaps team. We've seen them both in this game. It's the 1-1 pitch. Fastball just misses down and away, says Mickey Garcia. And it's now a 2-1 and one count on Jared Triolo. They appeal down to Nick DeMarkey to see if Triolo went around. He says he did not, so count remains. Two balls, one strike. And Miller through the windup. This fastball just off of the Tip of Triolo's bat, then clipped Gasper's glove and went all the way to the backstop as Asher Woods runs it down. Two balls, two strikes, nobody out in this top of the eighth inning. Miller through the windup and the 2 2 pitch. Fastball misses down and away, and the count is now full. Righty, righty matchup, full count. Triolo digging in. Now Miller through the windup and the payoff pitch. Fastball lined down the left field line, hooking foul. Triolo now retreating back towards the right handed batter's box. Full count, nobody out. Two to nothing the score. Whitecaps on top of the Braves. Miller through the windup and the payoff pitch. Fastball misses high for ball four, and Triolo starts off the top of the eighth with a leadoff walk. Well, this is an important appearance for Miller because now you would have to think he's trying to bridge the gap between Demers and Sam Bordner, who's the guy that Shevchik, as we've talked about, has kind of explicitly said he would bring in to close out the championship if Brewster is given the opportunity. And a leadoff walk, it's a tough way to start, especially after such a lengthy at-bat with Triolo. And now Hannah, a guy who, who's done damage this whole series, is digging in for Bourne. Jamison Hannah, left-handed hitting center fielder out of Dallas Baptist. Looks at a first-pitch fastball from Miller, then misses in off the plate for ball one. Triolo leading off first. Nobody out in the top of the eighth. Miller checks the runner, now comes set. And the 1-0 pitch. Fastball then misses high, now 2-0, and Mickey Gasper, as well as Julian Infante, the first baseman, will jog out to the mound to have a chat with the right-handed pitcher. And maybe a little telepathy there. They both went out right at the same time to try and uh, have the discussion. Two of the leaders on this team, and now, speaking of leaders, here comes Austin Straub, the leader of the, uh, the pitching coaches here for Brewster to continue the mound visit. Doesn't look like there's anybody happening in the, or warming up in the pen right now for Brewster. But this is an important spot, and I think it's a good time. If you're going to call the infield in, bring the veterans in, and have a conversation to reset, this is a good time. It almost reminds me of a basketball team calling timeout when they're down by five instead of when they lose the lead. Now it's a situation where you can try and just put a zero on this inning and try and keep this from turning into something after this leadoff walk. You don't want to wait until Bourne's already got one run across and a tying run's on third before you decide to reassess. Well, Justin Coons, the backup catcher for the Whitecaps, jog down to the bullpen. We'll keep a, an eye on the Brewster bullpen, see if anyone starts to get loose. 2-0 the count on Hannah as Triolo leads off first. Miller set. And the 2-0 pitch. Fastball hit in the air down the right field line, but way foul as Hannah was well out in front of that one. And the count now 2-1. Sam Bordner is starting to throw right now. Right-hander out of Louisville. As Hannah steps into the box, Miller looks over towards first. 
Now holds the set. And the 2 1 pitch. Fastball lifted in the air behind home plate, but that one will get over the backstop and drop behind the press box, and the count levels at 2 and 2. Miller in this postseason has appeared in two games, thrown an inning and two thirds. Whitecaps at double play depth with the middle infield back. Miller ready. And the 2-2 pitch. Breaking ball lifted in the air down the third base side. But that one will, again, drop out of play. So Hannah doing a good job battling here in the eighth inning. Now a 2-2 count. Hannah steps back in. Miller gets the first sign from Gasper and likes it. Two balls, two strikes. Here's the pitch. Fastball lined out into right center field. On the run is Chandler Taylor, and he makes the catch in right center field for out number one. This has been a banner day for Chandler Taylor defensively. Had a great jump on that play. Made it look a lot easier than it was to get to that baseball. And with a speedy guy like Hannah hitting that ball, it's very important to grab it. Nice play from Taylor. And now for Troy Miller, he's gotten out under his belt. He can kind of take a deep breath and reset a little bit. And now Kevin Radzowicz, the right-handed hitting designated hitter out of Fairfield, steps up to the plate for the Braves. He's 0 for 2 today as Triolo leads off first. Righty-righty matchup. One out, top of the eighth inning. Miller ready in the first pitch. Fastball on the outside corner for strike one. Whitecaps still a double play depth with just one out here in the eighth. Runner at first is Jared Triolo, who wor worked a leadoff walk to start the inning off. Miller ready in the 0-1 pitch. Fastball misses down and away, and the count levels one ball and one strike. Radzowicz, designated hitter for Bourne. Awaits the 1 1 pitch from Miller. Here it comes. Fastball misses high, now 2 and 1. Sam Bordner continues to warm for the Brewster Whitecaps, who lead this one 2 to nothing here in the top of the eighth inning. Miller, the right hander out of Michigan, holds the set. Kicks and deals 2 1. Fastball hit on the ground towards third. Fielded by Datras. Gets the out at second. Throw on to first. In time. 5-4-3 goes to double play to end the top of the eighth inning. So a leadoff walk does not come back to haunt Troy Miller. And we head to the bottom of the eighth inning with the Whitecaps up 2 to nothing. you You're listening to Brewster Whitecaps Baseball on the Whitecaps Radio Network.
Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle. Well, it's the top of the order for the Brewster Whitecaps in the bottom of the eighth inning. They lead this one 2 to nothing over the Bourne Braves as it's Nick Dunn, Mickey Gasper, and Marty Costas do up against Blake Whitney, right-hander out of the University of South Carolina Upstate, who has been the only reliever for Bourne as Whitecaps PA announcer Jim Nowak continues to read off the 50-50 raffle prizes. Although there's so many of them here today that he'll actually have to take a break and resume them after this half inning. First page to Dunn. Line to the right field on the run is Witherspoon, but that one will drop in front of him for a leadoff single. So Nick Dunn today, first <laughs> at bat or first plate appearance, works a walk. Typical Nick Dunn. Second plate appearance, first pitch swinging, fouls out to left field. We commented on it. Wow, we typically see him see a lot more pitches than that. Next at bat, grounds out to first after seeing a ton of pitches, and now goes first pitch swinging again for a single to right. However he gets it done, though, I'm sure Jamie Shevchik will love it. And that versatility is a great tool to have. I mean, Nick Dunn is seeing the pitches that he likes and going after him. That time, that aggressiveness paid off. A big leadoff single with the 2 3 4 hitters coming up. Now Mickey Gasper looks at a first pitch breaking ball from Whitney on the outside corner for strike one. Marty Costas waits on deck for Brewster. No outs. Dunn leading off first base. Whitney comes set, and the 0-1 pitch. Fastball misses off the outer edge, and the count levels at 1-1. One one. Gasper today, 1-3. One 1-1 one one pitch, breaking ball. This one finds the outer part of the plate. Now 1-2 and two on the Bryant Bulldog. Nick Dunn leading off first base, is, has an aggressive lead over there. As Whitney looks into Susie behind the plate, gets what he wants and comes set. One two pitch to Gasper. Breaking ball just misses off the edge. And the count now two and two on Gasper. Whitney trying to live with those breaking balls on the outside edge, has gotten two of them and missed twice. As the right hander now gets ready and deals two two. This one lined hard down the right field line, but hooks foul and right into the picnic table area here at Stony Brook Field down the right field line. So Gasper stays alive, and the count remains two and two. Whitney holding the set, 2-2 two -two pitch on its way. Breaking ball fouled off by Gasper, that one right behind home plate, and the count stays two and two. Gasper, a switch hitter, batting from the left side against the right-handed throwing, Whitney, who comes set and deals 2-2. Caught on and missed. Gasper chased a breaking ball downstairs for strike three, and that's out number one. Hasn't been the best day at the plate for Gasper. That's back-to-back -back strikeouts for him now, but it's been backed up real well from the rest of the lineup, including this next guy. Marty Koss is the left fielder out of Maryland, digs in. The play of the season for the Brewster Whitecaps up to this point was made out in left field by Costas to end the top of the seventh. First pitch from Whitney to Marty. Fastball on the outside corner for strike one. The bases were loaded for Bourne in that seventh inning. It was a full count, two outs. The tying run was in scoring position, and Lyle Lynn crushed one out to left center field. Costas ranged all the way to the warning track, dove, and made the catch. As he looks at a breaking ball that misses below the knees, says Mickey Garcia, and the count evens at one and one. Costas awaits the one one. His Maryland teammate Nick Dunn leads off first. And a breaking ball from Whitney in for a strike in the lower part of the zone. Now one and two on Marty. Costas today, 0 for 2. Does have a sacrifice fly, though, that coming in the third inning. And the 1-2 pitch from Whitney. Breaking ball that misses down and away. Good job there by Costas to lay off. And now it's 2-2 two and two on the Brewster left fielder. Hunter Bishop waiting on deck for the Whitecaps. Whitney shakes off Susie's first sign. Now gets what he wants. Kicks and the 2-2 two -two pitch. Breaking ball. Costas unable to hold up his swing, says Mickey Garcia. He chased that one down in the zone. And that's back-to-back -back strikeouts on breaking balls in the dirt from Blake Whitney. 
Yeah, he's done a terrific job commanding that breaking pitch. Clearly that's the best pitch that he's got in his arsenal. And now Hunter Bishop, who's already homered once today, that coming in his last at-bat, steps in for the Brewster Whitecaps. Two outs, bottom of the eighth inning. Nick Dunn leading off first base. Whitney set. And the first pitch to Bishop. This one lined hard down the right field line. Bishop, though, a bit out in front of it, and it hooks foul. Kyle Datcher's waiting on deck for Brewster as Sam Bordner continues to warm. Dunn leading off first. And the 0-1 pitch to Bishop. Caught on and missed. Chased the breaking ball down and in. Big home run swing there from Bishop. And the count now 0-2. Oh, and he was just fooled there with that breaking pitch. This has been a terrific performance from Whitney. Just that one mistake to Bishop earlier in his outing. Whitney comes set. And the 0-2 pitch. This breaking ball has no bite on it as it misses high and outside. And the count now 1-2 and two on the Arizona State center fielder. Whitney ready. And the 1-2 pitch. Breaking ball cut on and missed. Bishop down swinging. So after allowing a leadoff single, Whitney comes back and strikes out three in a row. Strikes out two, three, and four in the Brewster order to end the bottom of the eighth. No runs on one hit, no errors. One left on base for the Whitecaps. We head to the top of the ninth inning, and the Whitecaps still lead two to nothing here at Stony Brook Field. Now, back to Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Here are Carter Wadeel and Aiden Doyle. Back for the top of the ninth inning. It's still Troy Miller on the mound for the Whitecaps. He faces six, seven, and eight in this born order. It's Zach Suzy leading things off. Left-handed hitting catcher out of UConn. Miller worked a scoreless eighth inning for the Whitecaps, and this crowd is electric here at Stony Brook Field. First pitch from Miller. Fastball then misses downstairs for ball one. Susie today 0 for 3. Miller looking into Gasper, now through the windup in the 1-0 pitch. Fastball on the outside corner, strike one. One and one the count now to the leadoff hitter in the ninth inning. Susie asks for time, now steps back in, and the 1-1 pitch on its way. Fastball hit right back up the middle and into center field for a leadoff single. And now it'll be Tyler Fitzgerald, right-handed hitting shortstop and number seven hitter for Brewster. And give credit to Susie. That was a good piece of hitting because that pitch was, uh, was down below. Did a great job of just pushing it through the middle where nobody was. Good timing as well. And now it looks like we'll see a replacement out there for him. Yeah, we will have a pinch runner for the Bourne Braves. It's Andrew Frejay yep. out of Sam Houston State who takes over for Susie. So getting a little bit more speed on the base pass is born coach Harvey Shapiro. Fitzgerald, right-handed hitting shortstop out of Louisville. Righty-righty matchup. And the first pitch from Miller. Fastball on the inside corner for strike one. Good location there, down and in to the born shortstop. 
No outs. Runner at first for the Braves. Two to nothing to score. Whitecaps lead here in game three of the league championship series. Miller comes set. And the 0-1 pitch. Breaking ball misses way outside. One and one now the count. Fitzgerald today, one for three. Whitecaps at double play depth. Miller comes set, checks the runner, and the 1-1 pitch. Fastball hit on the ground, foul down the third baseline. Count now one and two. Miller got it, or excuse me, Fitzgerald got a good piece of it, but just a bit out in front of it. And now it's a one and two count on the number seven hitter. Miller looking into Gasper, checks the runner at first. Now comes set. One two pitch on its way. Fastball fouled back, just got a piece of it, did Fitzgerald, and the count stays one and two. Good location there from Miller on the outside part of the plate. Fitzgerald was just able to get the end of the bat on it and fouled it straight back into the backstop. One and two the count, nobody out, runner at first. One ball, two strikes, here's the pitch. Fastball hit on the ground up the middle, ranging to his left is Graffinino. He flips to get the out at second, throw on to first, in time! What a double play from the Brewster Whitecaps, 6-4-3 it goes. And now the Whitecaps are one out away. A.J. Graffinino, we've talked about his defense all season long, and he shows it off here in the ninth inning for the Whitecaps. We've seen a lot of pretty double plays this year. That might be right up at the top. But as you said, Aiden, moving to his left, right behind the second base bag, did a terrific job just to flip it over to Nick Dunn. A lot of the times we've seen Graffinino go to the bag himself on that play, but he realized Dunn was there, able to turn to, and as you said, Aiden, just one more. And now it's Grant Witherspoon, the number eight hitter in this born order, who looks at a first pitch fastball from Miller for ball one. That one missed high above the letters. Witherspoon today 0 for 3. 1 0 pitch on its way for Miller. This one lifted in the air down the left field line, but slicing out of play and foul. One ball, one strike, two outs. You can feel the tension here at Stony Brook Field. Miller through the windup. 1 1 pitch on its way. Off speed pitch misses outside. Now 2 and 1. Miller looking into Gasper. Gets what he wants. Here's the 2-1. Fastball skips home, and now it's 3-1 on Witherspoon. Witherspoon, the right fielder out of Tulane. Left-handed batter against the right-handed throwing Miller. 3-1 the count. Miller through the windup and the pitch. This one hit on the ground towards short. Fielded by Graffinino. Throw on to first. In time. Now and forever. The Brewster Whitecaps are kings of the Cape in 2017. The Brewster Whitecaps defeat the Bourne Braves and win their first Cape League championship since 2000. Can you believe it? The little team that could comes back and wins game three at home. Two to nothing. The final score. Brewster overborn. And fittingly, on a ground ball to A.J. Graffinino, who's been the defensive stalwart for the Brewster Whitecaps all season long, ends the game. Six to three, the final out, and a moment that these Brewster Whitecaps and their fans will never forget, Carter. What a season for Brewster. What a finish to this ball game. I mean, this, this kind of went all according to plan for Jamie Shevchik. The pitching did the job. The offense was able to get enough runs. It was Marty Costas and Hunter Bishop, two of the biggest bats of this playoffs for Brewster that were able to get it. And the Cinderella story is complete. I mean, what a season this has been for Brewster. They finished 500 in the regular year. They come in as the three seed. They have before them a win total in YD and Orleans, the largest win total ever beaten by a team to get to the championship series since the current playoff format was adopted in 2010. And now the Whitecaps are able to climb the summit and defend their home field here at Stony Brook Field. What a finish, what a ball game. And if you're looking at three plays that define this game, you're looking at the Marty Costas catch in left. You're looking at the Chandler Taylor catch in right. 
and you're looking, well, I guess at the, we'll make it four plays. The sacrifice fly <laughs> to center off the bat of Marty Costas and the Hunter Bishop home run to left field. Two to nothing, the final score, the Whitecaps, your 2017 Cape Cod Baseball League champions as they meet as a team surrounded by fans, mostly young fans who have enjoyed this ride as much as anyone. We've seen posters and signs all over the place in this town behind the Whitecaps dugout with words like, come on, Marty, let's go party, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Jules rules. We've seen get it done. We've seen Mickey barrels. It's been unbelievable the support that this team has had from this community here in Brewster. And what a ride it's been. First round, lose game one in heartbreaking fashion to the Whitey Red Sox. Come back and win two in a row to move on. Lose game one to the Orleans Firebirds. Come back, win games two and three against the best team in the league. And now, after losing yesterday with an eight-run fifth inning to the Bourne Raves on the road, they come back and shut Bourne out here in game number three. Will Tribuker once again delivers a stellar outing when the Whitecaps needed him most. It was a terrific performance for him, six and two-thirds strong for Tribuker. And if you're going to point for one guy on the pitching staff and perhaps one guy on the team that really was able to just dig deep and put in a performance for his team, you know, Will Tribuker in, in a summer league tournament, you know, it's hard to get pitchers to go their full potential when you're looking at, you know, they got to go back to school in a couple of weeks. You got to make sure they're not overusing their arm. And, and for Will Tribuker to give what he gave to this team, I know that's something that Jamie Shevchik, the coaching staff, and all these astute fans here in Brewster are never going to forget. They're going to remember what Will Tribuker gave to make this title a possibility here. Coming here as a temporary player, think about this, Carter. The three pitchers for the Brewster Whitecaps in this game. Temporary player at the beginning of the season, Will Tribeaker. Mm -hmm. Temporary player at the beginning of the season, Joe Demiers. Player who wasn't even on the roster until Will Tribeaker recommended him to coach Jamie Shevchik as a guy who, when the pitching staff kind of was decimated by injury, would come in and help this team out, gets the last six outs for Brewster to clinch their first championship since 2000. And now we see Nick Dunn, and Hunter Bishop presented with a couple of awards just in front of home plate. I'm assuming that's the playoff MVP. Maybe we got co-playoff MVPs. When you think <laughs> about it, Nick Dunn was fantastic this entire series. But for Hunter Bishop to just keep delivering opposite field home runs, he really found his groove in the playoffs. And when the Whitecaps needed him most, he stepped up. And this is so fitting to see, you, were, you touched on it a little bit earlier, Aiden, to see all the fans that were here. I mean, the bleachers are empty. All the fans are on the field. And, and surrounding the players, surrounding the team, listening to the Cape League commissioner giving out the Arnold Mycock Trophy to the Whitecaps. I mean, this is so fitting because Jamie Shevchuk, I remember, Aiden, when we first arrived on the Cape and had that welcome dinner over at the Brewster Baptist Church to kick off the season, and Jamie Shevchik had his first talk in front of the team. I mean, they were sitting in the pews of the sanctuary, and they all had their new jerseys and hats. They all looked a little bit nervous with their new teammates, and Jamie Shevchik, the first thing that he said to them was, you are playing for something more than yourself. You're playing for the town of Brewster, and you're playing for a group of fans that are unlike any other fans in the country. And it's so fitting to see those fans share the celebration with this team on the field right now. And if you remember correctly, Carter, as the team receives the Arnold Mycock Trophy, they gather just in front of home plate to the right as a team. This place is packed. The field is covered with fans. They all are gathered around the Whitecaps team who all get a hand on this Arnold Mycock Trophy. If you remember, Carter, last night, after a tough loss to the Bourne Braves, Coach Jamie Shevchik, who has been known to make predictions, came back with one more last night. He said, you know, when we come back to our place tomorrow and when we beat them, it's going to be great. He didn't say, you know, if we can win tomorrow. He said, when we do. Another win for the Brewster Whitecaps, another unbelievable run. They're your 2017 Cape Cod League champions. And I know Armora Sheridan's trying to get some interviews with these guys, but I love it. Let them have their moment here as a team, as a team that did the improbable. Going into the playoffs, this is a team that had to go through the three-time defending, champ, defending champion YD Red Sox. 
They beat them. Somehow. Okay. Nice first round win. Now you've got the machine and the Orleans Firebirds. Lose game one. Oh, darn. Now we're down 1-0 again. Come back. Win games two and three. Wow. This team now really has a shot. Then to lose yesterday, ca or series evens 1-1. And now the Whitecaps are going to gather out by second base, take a team photo with the Arnold Mycock Trophy, and boy, do they deserve it, Carter. Well, this is great to see. it. They're passing the trophy around. Kind of reminds you of uh, when a hockey team wins the Stanley Cup. They got the big old trophy, and folks were taking turn raising it and hooting and hollering. I mean, this is such a terrific scene. I mean, this ballpark on this game, we, got, we have this gorgeous weather, you know, this partly cloudy day in the sunny afternoon here in August. I mean, it's straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting, and now these fans are able to, to share in the moment as the Whitecaps pose for, for the photo as champions. And this is... Something that I don't know if anybody could have predicted at the start of the season or, or, or even more at the end of the season, at the beginning of the postseason. Uh, but this is baseball. This is what baseball can provide more than, I, I think, any other sport. Just this picturesque feeling and, and this incredible and probable victory for the Whitecaps. It's really something special. And here's your direct quote from Coach Jamie Shevchik after yesterday's game. I said this after series number one. Tommy Weber said it too. We're playing with house money. We want to win this thing, and it's going to be a great story when we do. Well, Carter, it's a great story, <laughs> and they did. And, and Jamie Shevchik deserves a ton of credit for what this Whitecaps team has done. You know, you, you and I, we've obviously been in every game that the Whitecaps have played this year, and more can say the same thing. And, and Jamie Shevchik, the way he's run his clubhouse, he's been very focused on, on the stuff that wound up being so important in this postseason, stuff like staying loose, trusting your teammates, you know, forming a camaraderie that goes beyond just guys who are trying to put on a show for the scouts that are sitting right behind home plate, playing for something bigger than yourself. It wasn't always easy for the Whitecaps to get that message. I mean, there was a time in the middle of the season when it looked like they were straying a little bit from that. But in the last couple of weeks of the regular season and in this playoffs, this magical postseason run, I think Jamie Shevchik must be so proud of these guys, and I can't wait to hear from him once, once more can kind of penetrate this uh, crowd of folks and get them over here. And it's not just this Brewster community that is get or that got behind these Brewster Whitecaps. I know before the game we sent out a tweet to some of the alumni. We had responses from Yonder Alonzo, former Brewster Whitecap and current Major League First Baseman for the Seattle Mariners. Billy Wagner, who has a legitimate case to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, he came back and retweeted our tweet. This entire Whitecaps family, not just the Brewster community, but the entire family, those who have played before this team, those who have been involved behind the scenes, the board of directors, the volunteers, interns, just like us, who have gotten in, gotten involved with this team and helped them on their way. And boy, let me tell you something. One of the best tweets we have right now is the University of Michigan baseball account who tweeted at the Brewster Whitecaps account, you know, congrats to Will Tribuker and Troy Miller because on the mound today, yes, Joe Demers plays for the Washington Huskies, but we had a couple of Wolverines who pitched great for this Brewster team. Yeah, they fought like Wolverines on the mound. A great day for the for the folks who are pulling for Go Blue in this game. But but just what a what a performance here for Brewster. And you're right. I mean, this is so strange. I mean, I remember when we were on the concourse before the game. I was listening in to a couple of fans who were chatting, and they said, "Well, I think if we can hit, we got a chance today." And I tell you what, this wasn't a great day for Brewster's offense. I mean, Hunter Bishop got a hold of a pitch, was able to just get one over the wall in left field. Costas got a sacrifice fly before that. And those are the only two runs. Brewster won this game, just like they did in Game 3 against Orleans, by the way, with pitching. And that is just so unexpected for the Brewster Whitecaps based on what we saw in the first part of the season and going back to last year where Brewster had a terrific offense, but their pitching just kept giving up too many runs for them to wind up making the playoffs. So I'm sure Jamie Shevchik is thrilled. I mean, at the beginning of the year, he kept talking about how he was going to try and find some hitting ge hidden gems to work with him on his pitching staff, and it took a little bit of some, took some time, took some roster turnover, took some guys who came in and left, and a lot of the shakeups in the starting rotation. But he's been proven right here because this has been a terrific performance from three guys: Will Tribuker, Joe Demers, and, and Troy Miller, as you touched on, Aiden, that nobody thought would be capable of this at the start of the year. And yes, I know it's it would have been nice to win it yesterday if you're a Brewster Whitecaps fan, 
but it's got to be even more special doing it on their home field in front of their home fans here in Brewster. And especially since this is the first title they've won in Brewster. I mean, they were in Harwich in 2000 over at Cape Cod Tech the last time they were able to hoist the, the Arnold Mycock Trophy. And so that's got to be really special for the residents of Brewster now that they, it's their first title for their town's team while their team is in their town. It, it really is terrific. And to see we still have a huge throng of fans on the field here. It, it really is a great image to, to see for everybody, just all the different colors, the white caps huddled in the center and all the fans mulling about on the outside, even a couple of uh, four-legged friends on the field as well, and everybody's got a big smile on their face here. And you got to believe the white caps have seen it a little bit too often this season, especially in this postseason. Ninth inning, two-run lead. That's been a situation they've been in before and haven't always come out with the best outcome. But here, Troy Miller able to get it done in the ninth inning. Allowed a leadoff single to Susie and then an unbelievable double play by A.J. Graffinito. Ranging to his left, flipped it back towards Nick Dunn who got the out at second and the throw in time to first to get Fitzgerald before getting Grant Witherspoon to ground out to Graffinito again. So a scoreless ninth inning. That's got to be a welcome sight for the Brewster Whitecaps after this postseason. It sure is. You're absolutely right. And, and for Troy Miller to be the guy who delivers it, another kind of unexpected thing for Brewster. But this playoffs for the Whitecaps, I mean, you, you want to talk about nail-biting games. I mean, this, this, this series, I know for the fans who are here and who follow this team closely, it's been, it's been a rough go of it. It's something that has, has caused a lot of stress and anxiety the way these playoffs have gone. I mean, losing in heartbreaking fashion in the first game against YD. Then the game three against the Red Sox that went back and forth, winning that one in 10 innings after you said, Aiden, they blew that lead in the ninth inning. Then they wind up getting the win in game three in that tense nail-biting affair against the Firebirds back on Thursday. Another nail-biter in game one where they wind up walking off on hit by pitch, and finally here they're able to be crown champions. And now we have a pair of Wolverines who can also add Cape League champions to their resumes. Troy Miller and Will Tribeaker standing by with more Sheridan. Thanks, guys. As you mentioned, I'm here with the two Wolverines that kind of saved the day for the Brewster Whitecaps. I'll start with Will. So you went in there, you got your second start in the playoffs. What were you feeling going into this game? I was told you were very locked in by your head coach. Yeah, every, everyone on our team this game, like we knew we were going to win from the beginning. Um, there wasn't any doubt in anyone's mind. We were going to find a way, whether it be scoring a lot of runs or good de defense. I mean, we had some great plays today. Marty Costas made a great play that saved the game. I think everyone, I think Brewster as a town deserved this. I was going to ask you about that. Your defense come, came up big for you too. A couple of double plays and bases loaded situations. Some Chandler Taylor had a great catch, and so did Marty Costas. I saw you get really pumped up on those plays. What did you say to those guys after they helped you out there? You know, they, they had my back all, all the way. I, I never have a doubt with any, any of the guys behind me. I'm just throwing to try to make them get outs, and they came up and made some big-time plays today, and I think those are probably some of the reasons why we won today. Speaking of someone that helped you out, your teammate at Michigan, Troy Miller, came in in relief and pitched the final two innings for the Whitecaps. What did you see from your teammate at school today? It's good to see. It's good to see him do well. He came out here late in the season, and he's been lights out for us the whole time. We, we trusted him, and we knew that we were going to finish the game with him. All right. Thanks so much, Will. I'll turn to Troy. So you just heard the praise from your teammate. What did you see from him today getting the start? Uh, he was locked in. It's funny that you said our head coach said that because I told everyone in the bullpen before the game he was locked in, and you could see it from the first pitch. You came in with for the first innings and pitched a great game. It was a little tense there because we know Bourne can come back. We've seen them do it before. What was your mentality going into the game in such a tough situation? All the infielders and outfielders have made plays all game. They were behind me the whole time, and they told me just to get out, so that's what I tried to do. I just saw the huge celebration, everybody asking for your autograph. How does it feel to just know that you guys are CCBL champions? Uh, I don't know if we feel anything yet. It's kind of unreal. But uh, all the guys were committed all summer, and it was awesome that they invited me out here at the end. So it was just a great celebration, and I'm sure we'll enjoy it tonight, too. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Back to you guys. Mora, and that was Troy Miller and Will Tribuker, two of the three Brewster pitchers today. And Troy Miller getting the last six outs for the Whitecaps. Will Tribuker absolutely stellar on the mound for Brewster. And now, right now, they're talking over with their fans. And I think that's just one of the more incredible stories for this Whitecaps team this season. Troy Miller, you know, not on the roster at the beginning of the year. And 
when this team was hit by injuries and some guys going home due to innings limits, things like that, Will Tribuker just says, hey, I've got a guy who can come pitch for us. Mm. And little did he know when he got the call saying, hey, one, you're coming to the best collegiate baseball league in the country for the summer. And then he gets the last six outs in game three of the championship series. I don't think that ever could have crossed Troy Miller's mind when he talked to Will Tribuker and said, hey, would you want to come to the Cape this summer? Yeah, it's true. And I tell you what, Troy Miller ain't alone. I mean, there are a lot of other pitchers. Zach Schneider is one that comes to mind. Connor McNamara, Ryan Sear. A lot of different of these players that the Whitecaps were able to bring in very late after the All-Star game ended. I remember, you know, when, when Zach Schneider was in Wareham, he was just coming in and said he was, wow, I can't believe I got the call to come in and play. And he's not alone in thinking that and just being glad to just be there and have the opportunity and, and to be able to not only say, I was there, I have the opportunity to come in and play but I was able to win a title I mean that's something's really special it's a very special moment indeed for all of these players all of these coaches everyone involved with this organization today and for the entire season year in and year out these Whitecaps fans trudge in and out of Stony Brook Field hoping to see a successful season and for Brewster it had been a bit too long 17 years since their last title that has now changed. Next year, it'll be zero years since their last <laughs> title. 2017 Cape League champions. And just really for this, like I said, this entire organization, not only had they not won a title, but they hadn't gotten close. Mm. Before this round or this postseason, they hadn't won a playoff series since their sweep over the Hyannis at the time, the Mets, in the 2000 championship series that got them their last title. They went 17 years without winning a playoff series. And I will say this, there is a new attendance record for Stony Brook Field. Today, 4,591 fans made their way out to the ballpark today, Carter. And boy, did it feel like it. Yeah, it really did. I mean, there were, we, we got our answer of how many people can fit into Stony Brook Field. I mean, this was such a, it was beyond a capacity crowd. I mean, I think if you look it up, they list the capacity of Stony Brook Field at like something like 4,000, and we got 4,500 today. So a little bit more than this place is, is, is intended to hold. We had folks right to the right of our press box standing up. We have folks up there in the trees over on the third base side peeking out from the bushes it looked like from where from my vantage point when I was over there on the first base side. And, and for that to happen for this Brewster Whitecaps team, the atmosphere here in Brewster, it really backs up everything that Jamie Shevchik said and, and that these Whitecaps players have been saying tomorrow during this playoff run. This is a special community, and these are special fans, and they deserve this win. And how about this? A little fun fact that I, I remembered yesterday but forgot about it as the game progressed today. Shane McDonald is now a double summer league champion this summer. Won the Hamptons League with the Road Warriors. That's right. His first championship of the summer. Then gets the essentially the call up to the Cape League and joins the Brewster Whitecaps. And they win the Cape League title. So he can add two championships to an incredible summer in 2017 for Shane McDonald. Only... In baseball, do things like that happen? Yeah, and, and to be fair, he only threw seven shutout innings in the Hamptons League Championship game, so he's had such a terrific summer for him in the postseason. And, and that's something that he can go to town with and say, listen, you know, when, I, when I'm when i in a big spot, I can deliver for my team, and, and certainly for him. He was able to get into the uh, game one of this series against the, uh, the Bourne Braves and had a terrific performance in, in all around for the Whitecaps when he was called upon. Pitched six innings in that game one versus Orleans. It was a losing effort in that game, but we talked about it at the time, how important it was that McDonald was able to go up and throw six strong just for the rest of the pitching staff. So to be able to say he threw seven innings in the Hamptons League Championship game, he threw six innings in a really important capacity in the Cape League playoffs in the same summer. It, it really is something for Shane McDonald. It certainly is a, a successful couple of weeks for him. And it's been those you talked about it at the beginning of the season coach Jamie Shevchik looking for diamonds in the rough it's been those guys who carried especially on the pitching side of it who carried this team to a title you we looked at the winning pitchers I'm trying to think Carter if this stat still stays true the winning pitchers in every win for the Cape or for the Brewster Whitecaps this postseason will were all either not on the roster at the beginning of the season or temporary players I believe with Tribuker's win today, that still holds true. It sure does. It, it sure does. Yeah, in this, in this series, the winning pitchers were Miller 
and then tried to today, and Miller got the save today. Going back, it was McNamara in Game 3 who got the win. Another save for Tribuker. Joe Demers was the winning pitcher in Game 2 against Orleans. And then in, in YD, the winning pitchers were Tribuker and Sear. So you're absolutely right. Either temps or new additions that got every W on the pitching staff for Brewster. Yeah, and it's been those guys who carried the team all season. This is a team... I believe I was talking with Coach Jamie Shevchik before yesterday's game in Bourne, where he said he lost, they lost about a dozen pitchers mm -hmm. to injuries or innings limits. This pitching staff is nothing like what Coach Jamie Shevchik expected it to be on June 13th. I mean, they, going into the season, he had a plan. He had an idea of how this rotation, how this season was kind of going to unfold roster-wise. And at least on the pitching side of it, everything changed. Mm -hmm. And yet, somehow, some way. This team was able to battle through it, getting guys like Shane McDonald, Troy Miller, Drew Reveno, Zach Schneider, who all made major contributions to this team. And I know they're far enough away from us that we can say this now, but Julian Infante and Chandler Taylor getting the Gatorade bucket from the dugout. And I believe that bucket, or at least the Gatorade slash water in it, has a date with Coach Jamie Shevchik's head. Oh, no, here it comes. They're coming, they're coming, and, yeah, well, they're kind of blocked by a crowd right now, but I would assume that just happened. We'll get photos and video of it from somebody later. But I'm, I'm assuming, oh, you know, there it is. We saw it, we saw it. There we go. There has been a Gatorade shower for <laughs> Whitecaps coach Jamie Shevchik. I hope, his, I hope his phone wasn't in his pocket there because he may be making a trip to the Verizon store after this game if it was. I tell you what, that was a lot of ice in that bucket. That was ice water that wound up getting on him. So I'm sure he's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty warm day. So refreshing for Coach Shevchik. And then another image here, we have a lot of kids that are out on the field right now playing catch. We got a kid taking pitches on the mound. We got, you know, folks doing cartwheels. We got a kid who's a group of kids who were out here, I know, at the end of game one earlier in this postseason having fun on the field. This is uh, just such a beautiful thing to see. And I know Hunter Bishop's brother, Braden Bishop, who's a former Brewster Whitecap and currently in the Seattle Mariners system, just pointed a, this out to us on Twitter. He said, you know, congrats to the Whitecaps on winning the title. And Hunter, on bringing home co-MVP honors for the playoffs, hits three bombs in seven days after hitting just one in the regular season. And, and he and Nick Dunn, I mean, I thought that was a terrific decision, you know, by the powers that be to give – co-MVPs to Bishop and Dunn. They both had very different postseasons, I think, but they both were extremely valuable. Hunter Bishop was able to get the big hits when they needed, those three homers that you were talking about, and Nick Dunn was as steady as possible at the top of the lineup. You know, when Nick Dunn came in, this is the other kind of one of the more prevailing stories in, in the Whitecaps season this year, is when Nick Dunn arrived with Brewster, he struggled. You know, this year, I mean, he had a great all-star campaign last season with the Whitecaps, but he wasn't getting his timing right. Clearly was trouble, you know, having trouble adjusting after he didn't really have the best Springs camp campaign with the Maryland Terrapins. And at one point, Jamie Shevchik sat him down and said, listen, you're a leader on, on our team. We need you to step up. And boy, did he ever. And speaking of those co-MVPs who stepped up, Hunter Bishop and Nick Dunn walking over towards the booth now. They are just about ready to stand by with our very own Maura Sheridan as we get the video Person ready to go, Mari McLaughlin, and well, it seems like they're ready to go. Maura, take it away. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm here with the two co MVPs of the championship series. I'll just ask you both a question What did it feel like when they called your name and you realized you were getting that honor today? Start with Nick. Uh, it was pretty special, you know, to, to spend the whole summer up here and get to know everybody and be around this great group of guys uh, to come this far. It was really cool. And Hunter? I mean, yeah, I'm super fortunate to have my name called, but I think this guy deserves it the whole year you know he put on a show the entire cape season and you know he just he helped me a lot throughout the whole entire thing so it's it's a blessing and i'm grateful for everything i got nick you were batting 500 in the playoffs what can you say about how you've just turned it on towards the end of the season and become really a clutch player for this brewster whitecap team uh just you know staying within myself is probably the biggest thing for me you were on the team last year that didn't even make the playoffs how does it feel to your second year come here and, and win it all uh, it's, it's pretty awesome, you know, to, to have a great group of guys like this, you know, to be with them all summer and to come this far and win. It's, it's pretty special. Three homers for you, Hunter, in the playoffs alone. You only had one in the regular season. How would you turn it up as the playoffs came along? Uh, I mean, I think it was just consistent at bats. You know, I was struggling early in the season, but then I find I kind of found my stroke throughout the entire season, um, and then especially late in the playoffs. So, I mean, as Chef told me, you know, it's going to take me a little bit. I might struggle in the regular season, but he said his plan for me was to turn it on in the playoffs, and 
pretty much do what I did, you know. So I, I was just, just glad to help the team in whatever way I could. You were one of the youngest guys on this team, but what was the moment when you realized this team was capable of winning a Cape League championship? I mean, it was pretty early, honestly. Um, just seeing how much talent the whole entire team had, line up one through nine, and then obviously our pitchers. It was, it's a special team. You know, I don't know if I'll ever play on a team as good as this, but you know, they're special guys, and you know, it's friendships for life. All right, thanks so much, guys, and congrats. Back to you guys. Thank you, Maura. Those were the co-playoff MVPs for the Brewster Whitecaps, Nick Dunn and Hunter Bishop. And I know Hunter hit the home runs, and he was an invaluable asset to these Brewster Whitecaps, both offensively and defensively. But Nick Dunn batting 500 in the playoffs, or at least coming into today's game, you know, obviously – he really turned it on when the Whitecaps needed it most. Yeah, I think it was 500 for this series for Dunn. It was a terrific performance for him, and especially in, in that game last night in Bourne. I mean, you know, that was such a, a rough game for Brewster when they went up to that lead, gave up that eight-run fifth inning, and Nick Dunn was steady Eddie through the whole thing. I mean, four at-bats reached base all four times. Three of them with singles, and he drove in three runs. So, And that's the way that Nick Dunn has been. I remember when he went on that 17-game hitting streak for the Whitecaps. It wasn't the best uh, – stretch of games for Brewster in the whole world and Nick Dunn was still able to just stay at the top of the lineup get Brewster the hits they needed and, and in baseball you can't ask for more than that and I would like to point out a little fun fact here as former Whitecaps intern and the person who sung the national anthem today Chris Lynch came over and gave us some high fives the Whitecaps in this postseason undefeated at home also undefeated when Chris Lynch sang the national anthem. So maybe we got a key to victory there. Chris <laughs> Lynch, his singing voice inspires the Whitecaps to victory. Maybe who knows? But he did a heck of a job of the national anthem, and I know him as a former Whitecaps intern is enjoying this as much as anyone right now. And you got to wonder, you know, these are a bunch of kids, these, these Whitecaps players. But they got to go back to school in a few days. I mean, Tony Losey from the University of Georgia, they start classes tomorrow. So... It's going to be a quick turnaround, but I don't think there are any of them that would have it any other way. I don't think any of them want to be back at school right now when they could be winning a championship like this. Yeah, this season could not have been any longer for Brewster. 53 games is the most a team can possibly play on the Cape, and that's what the Whitecaps did, and they were able to get the wins when it counted. Three game series wins in each of their rounds, and just such a terrific postseason and a great season for Brewster. And I know, you know, it reminds me of what Hunter Bishop uh, was saying, where they're going to go back to their colleges. Some of them are going to play on a lot bigger stages, a lot bigger stadiums, a lot more fans, but they're never going to play on a team like this, uh, in, in, you know, at least for the remainder of their collegiate careers. And Hunter Bishop clearly and, and Nick Dunn as well are recognizing that. Yeah, there is always just something special about coming to the Cape. Even if you don't win at all, having the opportunity to play here in the Cape Cod Baseball League in the most prestigious summer league in the country, it's very special for every player who gets a chance in it. But it's a little bit more special when you have a chance to win the title, which the Brewster Whitecaps did. And the winning coach, Jamie Shevchik, is with Moore Sheridan. Thanks, guys. As you said, Aiden, I'm here with Jamie Shevchik. In your third year as head coach, you brought it all home to Brewster. What was it like realizing that this community and everybody behind you is finally getting that victory? It was unbelievable. I can't, I can't explain the, the, the feeling. I mean, this, the whole atmosphere was angelic. It was, I mean, to see all these people here go crazy after we've, we've won that was, was the, by far the best experience that I've had. I've gotten to championship games in college. I've gotten to championship games in summer ball, but I've never won one. So for me, this was big, and for the people at Brewster, it's even bigger. You said to me before this game that this team deserves it. When did you realize this team had the capabilities to win it all? I think when we got into the YD series and we tied it up and we had nothing to lose after that, I kind of, you know, it, it clicked a little bit that the guys here really wanted to win. It wasn't here. It, it wasn't about showcasing their talent anymore. Um, you know, nobody was going home at that point. There wasn't any chatter about guys going home. We were left with the guys that wanted to win a championship, and that's where it really clicked. I just saw you talk to Nick Dunn's parents and talk about how you wish you could have him back for a third year because he's been so helpful to this team. Guys like Mickey Gasper and Julian Infante have also stepped up big for Brewster. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. But what was it like to see in the playoffs people like Nick and, and some of the returning players really step up for Brewster? I'm happy for them, you know, especially when we didn't even make the playoffs last year. Um, to come out here and win a championship, I mean, this – I'm happy for every single one of these guys. I mean, this is a group that I would love to be around for a long, long time. And that's the, the you know, the, the bad thing about summer baseball is we get to rent them for two and a half months. So hopefully we can get some guys to come back here next year. Hopefully we can have a great year again. It's going to be hard to top this one. 
Um, man, if somebody recorded this season, it'd be, uh, it'd be, uh, you know, it'd be a, an award-winning movie. That's for damn sure. You guys were solidly 500 this year, and seemed like everything clicked in the playoffs. What do you credit that to? I think it was just our guys starting to finally buy into to winning and and playing team baseball and trying to win a championship. Um, we had some guys that really stepped up. Guys like Chandler Taylor, who became another vocal leader, and Hunter Bishop. Everybody, everybody from the pitching staff to the guys that were on the bench, they were engaged throughout this the entire series. And you know, you saw it. I mean, you, you're, you're going to be able to go back and look at every video on Twitter and Facebook. You're going to see there's not going to be one kid that's down. Just one final question for you. How are you going to celebrate tonight, knowing that you are the CCBL championship coach? I'm exhausted. The last nine games have been probably more than, than the first 44. So I'm going to relax. I'm going to literally chill out, meet with a couple people, probably head back tomorrow, but I'm going to relax. This is the one that I want to just sit back and soak in. All right. Thanks so much, Coach Chef Chicken. And as always, thanks so much for talking to us every game. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, what a nice moment there between Mora and Coach Shevchik as they get a hug from each other. And yeah, for, for Coach Jamie Shevchik, this has just got to be a euphoric feeling. He used angelic, I'll use euphoric. I mean, he really, coming here on the Cape, last year, the way it ended for the Brewster Whitecaps, missing the playoffs after needing you know just one win or Chatham loss in the last five games, to make the playoffs, that didn't happen for him. It was a it was a rough way to uh, miss the playoffs and end the year. To come back this season with the number three seed facing YD and Orleans in the first two rounds and win, of course, in a game three. Yeah, it really was. It, it, I like the way that Jamie Shevchik put it. You know, you, you can't write a script like this. I mean, this was such – it seemed like every stop was pulled out for this tournament there was nothing that Brewster could have done that was more dramatic than what wound up happening and, and Jamie Shevchik you could Jamie Shevchik is a guy he's always been open and honest with us which we always appreciate but when he's talking to us you know he's saying what he needs to say and the emotion is kind of more reserved and and you could see it and and you could hear it listening how much this means to him personally and and how the you know the, the love that he has for the guys on his team you could hear that uh, when when Shevchik was talking tomorrow yeah, Coach Jamie Shevchik just really, really happy, really, like you said, soaking in the moment. And there are, like you mentioned, there are so many moments for this team along the way that have allowed them to get to this point. Coming out to a hot start, you know, 2-0 and to start the season. Then you have Marty Costas, the walk-off home run here, sweeping the doubleheader against the Braves here at Stony Brook Field early in the season. The Marty Costas home run when they won 11-10 to after trailing 10-2 to against the Mariners in seven innings. Then to go into the playoffs, how about the Connor McNamara game? Mm -hmm. That's a game three do or die against the best team in the league record-wise. And he's never made a Cape League start before, and he came out and shut them down for seven innings. And and it was it was a terrific play. I mean, you're right, seven innings, one run ball. The Whitecaps were able to win in a pitcher's duel where everybody kind of decided that if they were going to beat Orleans, it was going to be in a slugfest. But it's crazy. I mean, if you look, I've got the Whitecaps roster in front of me. If you look down the roster for Brewster, I mean, every single guy on the team did something in this postseason to help the Whitecaps win a game. Whether it was, you know, not all of it was getting a big dramatic home run or having a terrific seven-inning start, but everybody did something. They got key innings when the team needed to get a guy out there for a couple of innings. They got a base hit to keep a rally going and push an extra run across that would wind up being extremely important at the end of the game. It's things like that that Jamie Shevchik is talking about when he says this entire team was buying into the philosophy and everybody on the team did something to help them get the Arnold Mycock trophy. That's why they have it. Every single person on the team contributed to this run for the Brewster Whitecaps. Well, Carter, it's been an unbelievable season, not only for the Brewster Whitecaps, but for us here on the Whitecaps radio network. For Maura Sheridan, Koki Riley, Ma Marielle McLaughlin, Carter Wadil, the whole organization, the, the whole squad. I, wanna, I wanna, do want to give a huge thank you to Chris Kenny and, and Ned Monty and everybody else involved with the organization for giving us this opportunity on a personal note. I mean, this has been a great summer for us. I know, Aiden, you've done this before, but this is my first time on the Cape, and i just like to say thanks to everybody involved. They have treated us so well, and, and this has been such a great season to broadcast. An unbelievable season indeed. So once again, for the final time, thank you all for listening to an incredible season of Brewster Whitecaps baseball. Whitecaps, your 2017 Cape Cod League champions.
Thank you all for listening, and have a wonderful and safe Sunday night.